Mr. Secretary General, Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. Vice President of the Economic and Social Council, distinguished Vice Presidents, Deputy Prime Ministers and Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Let me request that you all take your seats so that we can proceed to the opening of the session. We have a full day and a long list of speakers. I invite all delegations to take up their seats so that we can start our meeting. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, please take your seats. We have a long day ahead of us and many speakers. So that we can begin the meeting accordingly. It is my honor to call to order the second meeting of the 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. I extend a very warm welcome to everyone. I am extremely pleased to see and feel the enthusiasm in this hall this morning, and I look forward to this important 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. I now invite the Commission to take up agenda item one, Election of Officers. The Commission will recall that at its first meeting last year, it had elected its chair and two vice chairs, namely Ms. Fatma Al Zahra, Hassan Abdelaziz Abdelkawi of Egypt, and Ms. Sheila Durbuzovic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. At the same meeting, the Commission postponed the election of the Vice Chairs from the Asia Pacific and the Western European and other states. I am pleased to inform the Commission that the Asia Pacific states have endorsed the candidature of Mr. Yun Saito of Japan and that the Western European and other states have endorsed the candidature of Mr. Andreas Glosner of Germany as the Vice Chairs for the 60th session of the Commission. In the absence of any other candidates, may I take it that the Commission wishes to elect Mr. Yun Saito of Japan and Mr. Andreas Glosner of Germany as Vice Chairs of the 60th Session of the Commission by acclamation. I hear no objection. It is so decided. On behalf of the Commission, I warmly congratulate Mr. Yun Saito of Japan and Mr. Andreas Glosner of Germany on their election. 
I would like to take this opportunity to thank my fellow Bureau members for their hard work and support throughout the preparations for this session of the Commission. I also wish to inform the Commission that following consultations in the Bureau, it has been agreed that our Vice Chair, Ms. Sheila Durbugovic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, will also assume the responsibilities of rapporteur for the 60th and 61st session. I congratulate Ms. Durbuzovic on this appointment. I now invite the Commission to appoint the remaining members of the Working Group on Communications on the Status of Women. Let me recall that last year the Commission appointed China to serve as member of the Working Group of its 60th and 61st sessions and postponed the election of other four members of the Working Group. I have been advised that the following members of the Commission have been endorsed by their respective regional groups to serve on the Working Group. Belarus, Belgium, Liberia, and Uruguay. May I take it that the Commission wishes to appoint Belarus, Belgium, Liberia, and Uruguay to serve on the Working Group on Communications during the 60th session of the Commission? I hear no objection. It is so decided. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I now invite the Commission to turn its attention to item two, entitled Adoption of the Agenda and Other Organizational Matters. The provisional agenda of this session is contained in document E slash CN6 slash 2016 slash 1 and the proposed organization of work is contained in Addendum 1. I invite the Commission to first consider the provisional agenda for the session as contained in document ECN 6 2016-1. The provisional agenda and documentation for the 60th session of the Commission were approved by the Economic and Social Council in its decision 2015-218. May I take it that the Commission wishes to adopt the provisional agenda? I hear no objection. It is so decided. I now invite the Commission to turn its attention to its proposed organization of work contained in document E slash CN6 slash 2016 slash 1 Addendum 1. In accordance with past practice, I would like to make the following proposal concerning the time limit for statements during the general discussion. Statements on behalf of groups shall not exceed 10 minutes. All other statements shall not exceed five minutes. May I take it that the Commission wishes to approve my proposal and the draft organization of work contained in Addendum 1 on the understanding that further adjustments will be made as warranted during the course of the session. I hear no objection. It is so decided. And I thank you for your cooperation. I would like to remind delegations that the deadline for inscription on the list of speakers for the general discussion is today at 1 p.m. As you are aware, we have a very long speakers list, which includes many ministers and vice ministers on an exceptional basis to accommodate as many speakers as possible during the first three days of the general discussion. An additional meeting is being scheduled tomorrow afternoon from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the General Assembly Hall. I would be grateful if you could adjust your schedules accordingly. The Secretary of the Commission will issue a revised list during lunchtime today. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Under Secretary General for General Assembly and Conference Management for making this exceptional arrangement possible. I appeal to all speakers to adhere strictly with the time limits and not to compel me to use my gavel. Please pay attention to the light on your microphone which will start blinking one minute before the end of the speaker's allotted time. When the time is up, I will gavel to signal that the speaker, to the speaker that he or she shall conclude. And by that, I mean finish a sentence. 30 seconds later, the microphone will be automatically switched off. 
I propose these procedures in a spirit of respect for every delegation's right to participate on an equal basis in our debate. With over 150 speakers inscribed on my list, I am sure everyone will understand the need to be disciplined and for the chair to be rigorous and equitable. I thank you very much for your understanding and cooperation. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I now invite the Commission to begin its consideration of Agenda Item 3, entitled Follow-up to the Fourth World Conference on Women and to the 23rd Special Session of the General Assembly, entitled Women 2000, Gender Equality, Development and Peace for the 21st Century. The documentation under this item is listed in today's journal. With your permission, I will introduce this item with a few opening remarks. <laughs> Mr. Secretary General, Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. Vice President of ECOZOC, Under Secretary General at UN Women, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Representatives of Civil Society, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. We are honored to have such a large number of government ministers, senior officials, parliamentarians, and experts who have traveled from capitals to this session and of members of permanent missions and entities of the United Nations system. I extend a warm welcome to the very large number of civil society representatives and salute your energy and determination. At this session, the collective committee commitment of the international community to achieve results for women and girls acquires a new sense of urgency. The 20-year review of the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action last year came to the sobering conclusion that no country has fully achieved equality for women and girls. In the political declaration adopted, we pledged to take concrete action to accelerate the full and effective implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action. Realizing gender equality is a truly universal task, a common challenge for men and women in all corners of the world. Women's activism has successfully reshaped the reality worldwide. As a man, I support this cause and feel encouraged by the increasing number of men working alongside women towards our common goal of equality. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development now presents us with a set of 17 sustainable development goals to be achieved over the next 15 years. Goal five on achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls sets critical targets in a number of key areas, including eliminating all forms of violence, recognizing and valuing unpaid care and domestic work, ensuring participation and leadership in decision-making and access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. Achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls by 2030 is crucial for poverty eradication and accomplishing the entire 2030 agenda in a manner that leaves no one behind. The systematic mainstreaming of a gender perspective in the implementation of the agenda is crucial. We can build on 20 years of experience in the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action. I am confident that CSW60 will draw inspiration from the spirit of 2015, when member states adopted the 2030 Agenda, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing for Development, and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. In all of these agreements, we highlighted the centrality of gender equality to achieve sustainable development. The priority theme selected for consideration at CSW60, namely women's empowerment and its link to sustainable development, provides us with an opportunity to focus on the gender responsive implementation of the agenda. This is the opportunity for the Commission to articulate clear guidance on the institutions, policy and funding frameworks, and the mechanisms for participation and, and accountability that need to be in place so that gender equality remains at the center of all implementation activities. Distinguished delegates, governmental gender equality mechanisms play a leading role in setting policies and act as catalysts within public administrations to ensure that all sectors and all policies contribute to the common goal. 
civil society organizations require a safe and enabling environment to champion and undertake advocacy on behalf of women and girls everywhere. I am certain their contributions throughout this session will be a valuable asset to the intergovernmental process. This session is well positioned to adopt strong agreed conclusions containing concrete and practical recommendations and key actions needed for gender responsive implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I recognize and commend stakeholders at the national, regional, and global levels for the work done to prepare for this session. Ministers and other actors have gathered in regional meetings in Santiago de Chile, Addis Ababa, Beirut, and Bangkok. Civil society organizations have mobilized their membership at the national and global levels to build alliances and strengthen partnerships for the work ahead. Here at UN headquarters, stakeholders convened in January to strategize for a successful session. Young people gathered last Saturday at a youth CSW to raise their voices and convey their messages to the attention of decision makers. The message from these fora is simple and direct. We have to move from commitment to action. Now is the time to determine the how of implementation for the benefit of all women and girls everywhere. We look forward to an inspiring and productive session where ministers exchange lessons learned and good practices, reaffirm political commitments, and converge on the way forward. We will focus on building alliances and engage in interactive discussions with experts on key strategies and partnerships for implementation. We will also evaluate progress on the elimination and prevention of all forms of violence against women and girls. Voluntary presentations by member states will help us draw lessons from these experiences. As always, numerous side events will take place during this session. These events are all lively spaces for networking, sharing experiences, learning and planning next steps beyond the formal meetings of the Commission. And I encourage everyone to take full advantage of these opportunities. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, Speaking at the Global Leaders Meeting on September last year, President Dilma Rousseff, the first woman to become President of Brazil, said, and I quote, I bring you a message of unwavering and firm commitment to implementing the Beijing Platform for Action, unquote. The truth is Brazil's engagement with gender equality has come a long way. In 1945, Brazil was among the very few to have included a woman in its delegation to the Conference of San Francisco. Dr. Berta Lutz, a prominent scientist and president of the Confederated Association of Women in Brazil. Thanks to the strong leadership and perseverance de demonstrated by Dr. Lutz and other women delegates, the Charter of the United Nations became the first international agreement to proclaim the equal rights of men and women as an integral part of our fundamental human rights. I am proud to recall that the Brazilian delegation presented a proposal for the establishment of a commission that later evolved into what would become the Commission on the Status of Women. As a leading intergovernmental body on gender equality and the empowerment of women, the Commission has an enormous responsibility in making sure that no woman or girl will be left behind. This can only happen if all members are united in taking the bold steps required to make gender equality a reality by 2030. I call on all of you to demonstrate the political will and commitment that will make a difference. We have the opportunity to lay the foundation for a world without discrimination and violence against women and girls, where all women and girls enjoy equal rights and equal opportunity, and all their human rights are respected and protected and their aspirations fulfilled. I count on your support to make this session memorable, meaningful, and transformative for all women and girls. Thank you very much. I have the honor to invite the President of the 70th Session of the General Assembly, His Excellency Mr. Mohens Lukatov, to address the Commission. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. Chair, Honorable Ministers, 
Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin to congratulating all of you. Because this time last year, we didn't have the 2030 agenda, but today, thanks to the commitment of many in this room, not only do we have the new agenda, but we have what I believe is a revolutionary agenda, one which can direct us towards a future where men and women, boys and girls, enjoy equal opportunities and full equality in a sustainable world. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an excellent starting point for this 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. Of course, the drive for gender equality has been the business of this Commission long before the SDGs, and the empowerment of women and girls has been advanced by courageous feminists, women activists, government officials, and others long before the 2030 agenda was agreed upon. So what exactly has changed since September last year? In many aspects, very little, not very much. Women of all ages, all religions, and in all countries continue to face discrimination in one sort or another. Adolescent girls continue to suffer violence and absence of opportunity and to have access to sexual and reproductive health and rights curtailed. Political systems continue to pay lip services to gender parity and governments con continue to clamp down on those who defend human rights. And labor laws and practices remain sacked uh, in favor of men as demonstrated by the fact that even in this organization, the United Nations, we have yet to see a female Secretary General. But what the 2030 Agenda has achieved is a change of the narrative around both the importance of gender equality and what is uh, that gives rise to inequality. The 2030 Agenda embraces the fact that gender equality is an absolute precondition for other changes we want to bring about by 2030. Tackling poverty and inequality, building peaceful and inclusive societies, fostering shared prosperity, and shifting to low-carbon, climate-resilient economies. And compared with the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals go to the heart of the prejudices and structural causes of gender inequality. Not only do the SDGs seek to ensure that women and girls can access essential services like health and quality education, they seek to empower them to make their own choices and enjoy their own rights. They seek to increase women's participation, not just in politics, but across society, to give them the choice to share or even forego caregiver duties and to enter the labor market to become drivers of change. With these changes, the time-bound, measurable and universal applicants of uh, 2030 Agenda has dramatically increased our chances of realizing what was agreed in Beijing back in 1995. The new Agenda can inspire the SDG generation to join governments, to join women's organizations, media, private sector, and others in what the He for She campaign calls a bold, visible force for gender equality. And it can further situate the Commission on the Status of Women as a critical part of that force. Promoting reform, influencing policies, and monitoring progress, this Commission has, can be the, watching, the watchdog which ensures that the entire implementation effort contributes to the realization of gender equality. During this session, the Commission has a unique opportunity to provide guidance to governments and others 
who are aligning their plans, core strategies and funding with the 2030 Agenda. It can remind governments that gender equality requires action, not just on Goal 5, but right across the Agenda. And it can highlight the pitfalls, opportunities and concrete steps towards uh, a gender equality, equal world by 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, we have 15 years to make this transformation happen. The needs are great and the change is long overdue. Let's get to it. Thank you very much and all the best for your work these days. I thank the President of the General Assembly for his statement. And I now have the honor to invite the Secretary General of the United Nations to address the Commission. I thank the Secretary General for his important... At this, at this time, you are addressing the Commission on the Status of Women in your present capacity as Secretary General. We would like on behalf of the Commission, all states and I, and on behalf of all women and girls and boys and men who champion the cause of women the world over, since this is the last time we'll be addressing the Commission, to thank you for your unwavering support throughout your tenure and to the advancement of the status of women. Your Excellency, Mr. Antonio de Aguirre, Patriota, Chairperson of the Commission of the Status of Women, Your Excellency, Mr. Borens Liketoft, President of the General Assembly, your Excellency Mr. Jürg Lauber, Vice President of ECOSOC, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, thank you for your leadership and strong commitment for gender equality and gender empowerment. And welcome to the United Nations, and I deeply appreciate it. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here today with so many distinguished women leaders all from all around the world. I feel truly inspired. You empower me, and I'm energized by your energy and strength. I thank you very much. You are here to change the world. When I see all of you from so many from different countries with so much experience, and much strong commitment, I know we can achieve full equality for all women everywhere around the world. As well as my first speech to the General Assembly, as soon as I was elected as Secretary General in 2010, that was October 2010, at that time, I promised to push for gender equality worldwide and within the United Nations. As Eleanor Roosevelt famously said, human rights start close to home. During the last nine years as Secretary General, I have appointed more than 150 distinguished women as Assistant Secretary General and Under Secretary General. When I took office, there were no women special representatives, often known as SRSGs, in the field. Today, nearly 25% of UN, women, uh, UN mission are headed by women. That is not nearly enough, but it is a major step in realizing the Security Council's historic resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. We are now shattering glass ceilings, and this commitment will continue. The deeply rooted prejudice that women are not capable of dealing with security matters, that is completely wrong and untrue. I did my best to promote women at the United Nations, and I call on all governments, businesses, and others to step up gender equality, which demands nothing less than full respect for the human rights of women and girls everywhere. 
everywhere I traveled, I tried to understand women's concerns. I was angered by their political exclusion. I was dismayed by the slow progress on maternal health, and I knew it was long past time to end the pandemic of violence against women and girls. In 2010, we consolidated four existing different UN entities dealing with women under the powerhouse of UN women. I appreciate excellent leadership of Her Excellency President of Chile, Michel Bachelet, who led as the first head of UN Women. And I'm deeply grateful to our outstanding current executive director, Madam Fumzile Umlapo Nkocha. <laughs> our new global force for women has made its mark. And I congratulate and I'm deeply appreciate. We set up the Every Woman, Every Child movement because no mother should, be, should die while giving birth. And no infant, <laughs> and no infant and child should die when we could have saved them earlier. We launched our Unite to End Violence Against Women campaign. I was proud to be the first man in the world to sign up to the He For She campaign to mobilize men and boys. <laughs> this built on my network of men leaders fighting for full equality around the, around the world. I believe that without changing the mentality of men, this will be very difficult. I'm urging, again, men leaders to change their mentality and their way of thinking and way of doing business. Violent extremists, <laughs> violent extremists are striking at United Nations values, waging battles on the bodies of women and girls. The new United Nations plan of action to prevent violent extremism sets out specific proposals to give women more influence in the, global propose, in the global responses. And the plan calls for ensuring that efforts to counter terrorism and violent extremism never violate any human rights. When we stay true to our principle, we stay on the right side of history and the winning side on this issue. Excellencies, distinguished ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for all that we have done together. And I call on you to do much, much more. In nine years as Secretary General, I have traveled to some of the harshest places on earth for women. Yet, there are, yes, there are crimes, victims, but in the toughest conditions, you find the strongest heroines. In countries where children have been dis disappeared, grandmothers stood up to demand justice. In areas raised by HIV AIDS, HIV positive mothers replaced the stigma with the hope. In homophobic societies, lesbian victims of rape survived and organized. In communities that practice FGM, activists said it should not stand for female genital mutilation. FGM should stand for focus on girls' minds so that FGM means F finally, G girls, M matter. Finally, girls matter. Where violent extremists threaten female students, young girls courageously attend schools. In United Nations peacekeeping operations, our female police officers serve 
as role models of equality. At State House and in Parliament, women officials show that leadership has no gender. I take this opportunity as Secretary General of the United Nations to make a personal appeal. I urge action by all those leaders of the countries where not even a single woman is in the parliament or cabinet member to end this injustice. There are still four countries in the world where not a single woman is represented in the parliament and eight countries in the world without any woman in the cabinet. I'm not going to disclose the names of the countries today, <laughs> but I'm urging they know who you are. <laughs> I'll be checking every day until the last day of my mandate as Secretary General. I'll keep pushing until the world has no parliament and no cabinet without any woman. In clinics and labs, <laughs> schools and courthouses, farms and boardrooms, women leaders insist on equality and show its value. In the face of grave threats and attacks, women human rights defenders stand for freedom and women journalists speak out for the truth. I pay tribute to the thousands of heroines I have met along the way, and I commend the men who join us because they know women's rights are human rights that we secure for the benefit of everyone. Mr. Chairperson, distinguished ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as long as one women's one woman's human rights are violated, our struggle is not over. We have to continue until we are sure that all the women's human rights are promoted and protected. The world is full of inequalities and injustices for women and girls. But after nearly 10 years as a Secretary General, I know those are no match for our resolve to create a future of full equality. Thank you all for ins inspiring me with your outstanding commitment. I thank you for being such an incredible source of energy and dynamism. I may be leaving my post at the end of this year, but I will never abandon uh, this cause. I will always stand with you. I will always stand with you in the struggle for equality for all women and girls so that we can make this world a better place for all. Ladies and gentlemen, let's work together to make this better for all where men or women, old or young, rich or poor, can live with human dignity. I count on your strong leadership and commitment. I thank you very much. Congratulations. Very good speech. I thank the Secretary General for his statement and for being with us this morning. Your leadership, Mr. Secretary General, has been truly inspiring for many around the world. Thank you for those words. I now have the honor to invite the Vice President of the Economic and Social Council, His Excellency Ambassador Jürg Lauber, Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the United Nations to address the Commission. Mr. Chair, Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. Secretary General, Madam Executive Director of UN Women, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. Let me first convey the sincere regrets of the President of the ECOSOC, Ambassador Ojun, 
who could not be here today due to travel commitments. I am honored to address the opening of the 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women on his behalf. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear colleagues and friends, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development rightly positions the achievement of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls as one of the sustainable development goals on its own right. It thus recognizes that the achievement of gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is crucial to achieving sustainable development. At the same time, it makes clear that the entire agenda must deliver for women and girls. The full, effective and accelerated implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action and of the CEDAW Convention will help us to do so. The Paris Agreement adopted by the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was another achievement in the promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment. In Paris, parties committed to respect, promote and consider their respective obligations on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls while addressing climate change. Adequate financing will be critical to turn commitments into action. To this end, the Addis Abeba Action Agenda commits to undertake legislation and administrative reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources and to promote gender responsive budgeting and tracking. The Commission on the Status of Women continues to be in the forefront of setting the global agenda on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. At the core of your work lays the review and follow-up of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. You have been assisting the Economic and Social Council in assessing global progress on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, identifying gaps and emerging issues and recommending corrective action. The Council continues to count on the Commission to galvanize broad political support for measurable progress for all women and girls in all parts of the world. Your work is truly indispensable. This session of the Commission on the Status of Women coincides with the beginning of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda, which was launched barely six months ago. In addition to defining the key enabling conditions for a gender-responsive implementation of the new agenda, CSW60 provides an important opportunity to give clear and concrete guidance on national-level implementation towards achieving the SDGs by 2030 and the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. The Economic and Social Council welcomes the fact that the Commission's priority theme of women's empowerment and its link to sustainable development is closely aligned with the Council's theme for this year, which reads, implementing the post-2015 development agenda, moving from commitments to results. The inputs from CSW60 will also be an important contribution to the work of the ECOSOC leading up to the high-level segment and the high-level political forum. The Council also welcomes the fact that going forward, the Commission intends to consider its future priority themes in the light of possible linkages to the 2030 Agenda, so as to build synergies and contribute to the work of the Economic Social Council system and the High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. The principle of integration will be at the core of implementing the 2030 Agenda. This will no doubt have implications for the work of the ECOSOC system. It will require the Council's subsidiary bodies, of which this Commission is an important member, to harmonize their work, programs and agendas, to align their themes with the main theme of the Council, to synchronize their calendar of meetings and to provide coordinated inputs to the Council in accordance with their respective mandates and areas of expertise. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the Economic and Social Council will continue to do its part to contribute to progress for women and girls. Indeed, the entire ECOSOC system has a mandated responsibility to eliminate and prevent all forms of discrimination against women and girls, 
and to accelerate realization of gender equality. More progress is needed as functional commissions do not yet consistently reflect gender perspectives across all areas of their work. The Council welcomes the leadership role of the CSW and its efforts to act as a catalyst for gender mainstreaming within and beyond the ECOSOC system. The Council will continue to support the Commission in this regard. The international community needs a strong Commission on the status of women to be an effective platform for norm setting and engagement with relevant stakeholders. Your session over the next two weeks will be a valuable step towards addressing the medium and long-term challenges of realizing gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls by 2030. To conclude, I would like to pick up on a remark by the Secretary General. Seen from up here, there is indeed a rare and vibrant energy in the room today. And I wish you success with all your endeavors over the next two weeks, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I thank the Vice President of the Economic and Social Council for his statement. I now invite the Under Secretary General for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women and Executive Director of UN Women, Ms. Funzile Mlamonguka, to make a statement and introduce the reports of the Secretary General listed under Agenda Item 3. Chair of the Commission of the Status of Women, His Excellency Mr. Antonia do Aguera Patrata, President of the General Assembly, His Excellency. Mr. Lekatov, Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Vice President of ECOSOC, Ministers, Women and Civil Society Representatives, Representatives of the Youth CSW, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. The 60th Commission on the Status of Women is the first CSW of the new 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Our theme is women's empowerment and the link to sustainable development. Because of the hard work by many of you in this room and beyond, the sustainable development goals include gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls as a centerpiece, with enabling targets threaded throughout all the other goals. Making gender systematically integrated into the implementation of the whole agenda. This commission is the largest and most critical intergovernmental forum with the diverse women's voices that can influence the road to 2030. Please allow me to warmly thank the chair of the CSW and his bureau for all their work in preparing this complex event and also I thank the UN, UN Women team for the meticulous management of the arrangements. This session marks the beginning of the countdown to 2030, to the future we want in which no one is left behind. A future in which there is substantive gender equality. This is not a moment to reopen and renegotiate what was already agreed to at the historic General Assembly of 2015. Excellencies, the agenda you adopted is bold. It's ambitious, it's transformational. Now we gather to seek implementation modalities that match this bold agenda where there can be no business as usual. As we acknowledge progress made, especially in the last 20 years, we also note that for many women and girls at risk, 
that change is not happening fast enough. For example, it is forecast that it will take 50 years to achieve parity in political participation and 118 years for true pay equality between men and women at the current pace of change. To break these trajectories and achieve Planet 5050 by 2030 will take dramatic steps in the adoption of business unusual by all of us. Excellencies, the session should benefit from the historic efforts and the experience of millions of women all over the world that have brought us here and from the contribution of many member states. It will also benefit from the force and inspiration of young generations who are weighing in on this agenda with a clear eye to the future they will inhabit. I'm proud to announce that the first youth CSW met for two days to discuss the implementation of the SDGs. We are delighted to have youth representative with us here today who will make, and one of them will make a brief statement. We recognize the need to include and engage youth with greater seriousness. And we have just launched our youth and gender equality strategy. Thank you to the envoy on youth, Mr. Ahmad Alehendawi, for his support and to all our partners. There are 1.8 billion young people aged between 10 and 24 years old in the world the largest youth population ever. Agenda 23 is largely about them and for them. The CSW Youth has called for education about gender equality and the rights of women and girls to start at an early stage with formal and, uh, and non-formal education. We know that in order to bring the new agenda to life, we need to, clo to be closest to those who are most disadvantaged. Governments cannot deliver alone on their strong commitments. Collaboration with civil society and women's organizations is key. It also means greater support and protection of civil society is needed to ensure greater political space and capacity for civil society. Just last week on International Women's Day, we paid our last tribute to respect and respect to a defender of women's rights. Beta Kakaras, a feminist activist, environmentalist, defender of indigenous of all human rights, who was shot dead in Honduras on the 3rd of March. She is one of the latest victims of the fight to assert values against the power structures that could compromise Agenda 2030. She paid the highest price. To implement this agenda, the support of private sector is also needed. Globally, there are intense hardships with extensive population displacement, extreme violence against women and girls, widespread instability in many regions. The extraordinary challenges, such as the current refugees and migration situation, require us to work together to address the root causes in the countries of origin, in the countries in which the refugees and migrants will be on transit, and in the countries of destination. This is a new challenge on which we need to collaborate and find new ways and sustainable ways of responding. But despite these problems and challenges, CSW 60 has to be a positive moment. It has to be as positive as we were when we adopted Agenda 2030 last year. That was arguably one of the finest moments for the UN and the global community when all of us put our difference together and in the interest of humanity and for women and girls, we adopted Agenda 2030. What was agreed in the 2030 Agenda calls on all of us to change, to change the way we live, the way we do business, the way we grow food, the way we value motherhood and engage and protect boys and girls, the way we communicate, 
and also to respect and recognize the rights of those different from the mainstream in their sexual orientation or in any other way. It is also important to recall that Agenda 2030 enhances, not replace the Beijing platform for action. Governments revalidated the Beijing platform last year in September after adopting the SDGs when more than 19 leaders answered UN Women's call for action to recommit to it and to step it up for gender equality. We have collated these commitments in a book and we intend to follow up so that both the SDGs and these commitments to the Beijing Platform for Action are implemented together. This validation of the Beijing Platform for Action has also been supported by civil society, the private sector, and in turn, they have also made their new commitments. This is the moment to capitalize on all these positive commitments. It is a moment for all of us to step it up uh, and also to commit to Agenda 2030 and to ensure that we have decisive, implementable, and transformative actions. For example, we are launching a partnership to take action on barriers to women's economic empowerment through the newly announced Secretary General's high-level panel on women's economic empowerment. This is jointly led by a head of state and a head, a CEO of industry. The panel includes participation of trade unions, women, civil society organizations, academics, IMF, the World Bank, with critical support from the UK government. Further, we are collaborating to implement flagship programs that have the capacity to transform the lives of women and girls and community at a scalable level, at a regional, global, and national level. These are efforts to reach out to those furthest, those who need our help most. Goal 5 and its targets are at best examples of how universal and relevant this agenda is for those who are left behind. Goal 5, for example, is a framework to end all forms of discrimination, including tackling discriminatory laws, to eliminate all forms of violence against women, including harmful practices such as child marriage and FGM and honor killings, to recognize the value of unpaid pay work and domestic work, to ensure substantive increase in women's participation in leadership and decision making, to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights in accordance with the program of action of the International Conference of Population and Development and the Beijing platform for action. To make these reforms, it is also important that we consider the, the role of economic participation on women, which is also reflected in Goal 5. This week, we will undertake a journey to close the gender wage gap, which globally is at 24%. All of these are important in Goal 5. Goal 5 also calls for us to enhance the use of enabling technology, in particular ICT. This has been stressed by our youth delegates along with the importance of closing the digital divide and the positive use and accountability of social and traditional media. Our youth delegates also underline the meaningful engagement of women in climate justice, migration, and the implementation of security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. We also are taking advantage of each of the 17 goals of Agenda 2030, as each goal is relevant for women and girls. In each goal, we can reflect concrete actions that focus on supporting those who need us most. In addition, to bring life to goal five and ensuring that all goals work for women, we have identified enablers for gender responsive implementation. They include effective and inclusive national institutions that implement non-discriminatory laws and policies, effective participation on women and civil society organization, because evidence shows that autonomous feminist organizations 
that advance women's rights are the most critical factor in the implementation of gender equality policies and supports monitoring and accountability. Gender responsive data collection to support the monitoring of the goals and their implementation, as well as to enhance accountability. Age and sex disaggregated data is also critical. I am pleased to announce that UN Women is launching the global database on violence against women later today. This also is supportive of our theme that is being re the review theme for this year. Last and mission critical, significant increase in investment to close the gender funding gap. Excellencies, the pace and quantum of change we have seen over the decades is directly correlated to the investment that we have made to women and girls. When we make good investment in women and girls, the return is high and life-changing. When we start with the national budget and international budget, and we direct them as investments to enhance gender Gender, empower, gender equality and empowerment of women, we will see impact in the quality of life on women and girls. This will provide change in favor of women, especially those that are left behind. Hesitation that dogs us in relation to closing the gender funding gap in an agenda whose success depends on gender equality and women's empowerment set us on the wrong path that reduces the impact of our bold and transformational agenda. To leave no one behind, the bulk of our investment must secure clear wins, not just involvement, especially in rural development and agriculture, in public health and education, in family planning services, in water and sanitation, in social protection, in scalable program for economic well-being of women and girls, in ending violence against women and girls, and in the respect of the rights of women and girls and access to justice. Those who are being left behind can be easily identified. They do not have these basic needs. Those left behind and experience stubborn intersectionality and cumulative disadvantage are likely to include people living with disabilities, indigenous and rural communities, migrants and refugees, LGBTQI communities, adolescent girls and older women. In an agenda 2030, you have decided to reach them. CSW60 is the first test of our resolve and an opportunity to make a historic chief shift. Excellencies, I thank your leadership, your foresight, and ask you to hold steadfast to the principle that inspired the vision of Agenda 2030 in negotiating the agreed conclusion. We know we must engage not only our traditional partners, but also involve men and boys in large numbers and reach out beyond our comfort zone to those with whom we may not agree with or sympathize with. We want to be encouraged by the sheer volume of different interest groups that coalesce around this commission. This clearly is the evidence that there's a high level of interest in the opportunity and the potential of this moment. Together with a total of more than 450 events in and around the commission, we will be able to experience the unity of purpose. In your hands is a once in a lifetime opportunity to end poverty for the next generation and within the next 15 years to transform gender relations irreversibly, making the world a better place for all. Let us seize the moment. And now I would like to invite Ms. Vanessa Agnotti, representing the CSW Youth Forum, to make a short statement. Your Excellencies, President of the General Assembly, Chair of the CSW Bureau, you and women, Executive Director, and distinguished guests. On behalf of all young women and young men, in all our diversities, from all corners of the world, with our varied experience, 
we thank you for this opportunity to effectively participate in CSW 60. We are grateful to UN Women Executive Director, Madam Pumzile, for your personal commitment and leadership in placing young people at the center of the CSW agenda and for the adoption of UN Women's Youth and Gender Equality Strategy, highlighting the much needed LEAPS framework. We thank the Chair of CSW, His Excellency, Ambassador Patriota, for becoming the first chair to receive the youth statement. Thank you to all governments who have included us, young women and young men, as members in their delegation and for supporting young people as civil society delegates. We thank the World YWCA, UN Women, and the UN Interagency Network's Working Group on Youth and Gender Equality for convening the first youth forum at CXW60. We, as young people of the world, recommend the following. For member states to incorporate the youth forum recommendations into the agreed conclusions during your deliberations to celebrate opportunities and invest resources, political will, and concentrate support to young women and girls in achieving gender equality, which is key to the SDGs. To ensure that all young women and girls have a voice and appropriate skills to enable them to make informed decisions exercise their leadership, and negotiate for access to services. We specifically call for action to end all forms of violence against women and girls, especially FGM, child and early forced marriage, among others, and request for continued support to survivors of violence. We call upon all young men and boys to become our partners in achieving gender equality. In conclusion, we request that you institutionalize the Youth Forum at CSW and adequately resource it as a permanent. As leaders today, the SDGs are about our lives now and our collective tomorrow. We stand with you in finding innovative and lasting solutions to achieve gender equality by 2030. We call upon all of you for becoming our partners in achieving Planet 5050 by 2030 latest. Her story was created now. And I thank you. Let me thank the Executive Director of UN Women, Funzili uh, Mlambonguka, for her statement and welcome her to the podium. And also thank Vanessa Agnotti for representing the CSW Youth Forum. I now invite the Chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, Ms. Yoko Hayashi, to introduce the report of the Committee. Mr. Chair, Excellencies, the distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to present the report of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in my capacity as Chair of the Committee. Significant progress has been made in protecting human rights of women thanks to the efforts undertaken by states in all regions of the world. This progress is a direct result of the obligation that you have accepted by becoming party to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. With 189 state parties, the Convention enjoys almost universal ratification and is the only human rights instrument that provides comprehensive protection of human rights of women. 
this year's priority theme of the Commission on the Status of Women, Women's Empowerment and its Link to Sustainable Development, and its review theme, the elimination and prevention of all forms of violence against women and girls, have been at the heart of the work of our committee over the past year, which I shall present to you today. Since the adoption of its landmark general recommendation number 19 on violence against women, the committee has consistently raised various forms of violence against women and girls in its dialogue with state parties on the reports that they periodically submit to the committee. During the last year, the committee held dialogues with 27 state parties and assessed the follow-up reports of 26 state parties. I would like to take this opportunity to commend the state parties on the high level of expertise of their delegations, which has greatly contributed to the quality of the dialogues. The committee supports and has implemented many of the measures envisaged in General Assembly Resolution 68 to 68 on treaty body strengthening. We count on the continued support from member states to be able to cope with the increased workload resulting from the treaty body strengthening process. The committee took action on 10 individual complaints last year. The committee also continued its work on a number of confidential inquiry submissions alleging grave or systematic violation by state party of rights set forth in the convention. It is noteworthy that the majority of cases and this optional protocol concern various forms of violence against women and girls in both procedures can serve as effective early warning mechanisms. In order to update its general recommendation number 19, and reflect new developments in the national, regional, and international spheres, the committee established an informal working group to elaborate a new general recommendation on gender-based violence against women. A first draft was discussed by an expert group meeting organized by the London School of Economics, Center of Women, Peace, and Security in February 2016. In this regard, I take the opportunity to acknowledge the excellent cooperation between the CEDAW Committee and the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, uh, Ms. Dubravka Simonovic. Gender-based violence coupled with armed conflict and extremism often forms a push factor in women's decisions to leave their home countries and seek protection abroad. For the third consecutive year, we witness massive influxes of refugees who are fleeing armed conflict and violence. Recording our general recommendation number 32 on gender-related dimensions on refugee status, asylum, nationality, and statelessness of women, the committee noted that women and girls are especially vulnerable to abuse during mass displacement situations and called on state parties to respect the principle of non-reform um, To mark the 15th anniversary of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, um, the committee convened a panel discussion on connecting CEDO and women, peace, and security agenda in November 2015. The committee also adopted in July 2015 the new general recommendation on access to justice. This general recommendation provides guidance to state parties on how to eliminate discriminatory procedures, practices, and stereotyping within justice system. It also makes recommendations on how to ensure women's access to justice in specific area of law and within specific mechanisms, such as plural justice, justice system, specialized judicial and quasi judicial systems, and alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Mr. Chair, 
We welcome that gender equality and women's empowerment has been included as a standalone goal and mainstreamed in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. However, it is of crucial importance that the 2030 Agenda and its implementation are soundly grounded in a human rights-based approach to development. This includes the rights and standards contained in the CEDAW Convention. By the same token, the CEDAW Committee should take the outcome of the high-level political forum country review into account when preparing its dialogue with the state parties to the CEDAW Convention. Throughout the past year, we have explored possible ways and means to integrate the Convention in the follow-up and review of the SDGs. Mr. Chair, inclusive and sustainable development must uphold the rights of rural women. In its most recent general recommendation number 34 on the rights of rural women adopted in March 2016, the committee recognizes the vital contribution of rural women to rural development and provides guidance to the state parties on obligation in relation to specific dimension of the rights of rural women, such as an access to political and public life, employment, health services, economic and social life, land and natural resources, and adequate living conditions. In addition, in February 2016, the committee held a half day of general discussion on gender-related dimensions of disaster risk reduction and climate change. As a first of the phase in the preparation of the general recommendation on the topic, the general recommendation will aim to integrate a gender perspective into global efforts to significantly reduce the risk and impact of climate change in the context of sustainable development and in line with the 2015 the Paris Agreement under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mr. Chair, before concluding, let me express the Committee's gratitude to all partners, including other treaty bodies and human rights mechanisms, the United Nations and its specialized agencies, member states, NGOs, national human rights institutions, and many other actors. The support and information received from these partners are crucial for the Committee to gain a clear view of the status of women's rights around the world. I thank you for this opportunity to, to have addressed to you. Thank you very much. I thank the Chair of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women for her statement. And I now invite the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, Its Causes and Consequences, Ms. Dubravka Shimonovic to make a statement. Mr. Chairperson, Executive Director of UN Women, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to address you today for the first time as a special rapporteur on violence against women, its causes and consequences, and to contribute to discussion of the Commission on the Status of Women on this uh, topic related to sustainable development and on follow-up to the review team on elimination of violence against women and girls. This year's topic is timely, since 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provided us with a global gendered framework with gendered transformative goals and with standalone goal on a specific target on elimination of all forms of discrimination and violence against women and girls in public and private sphere. So it is for the first time that we have reference on the elimination of violence against women in such high level documents. My mandate is ready not only to monitor progress achieved, but to give a credible guidance to states and other stakeholders in preventing and ending violence against women and girls in order to make real change and to leave no woman or girl behind. 
My mandate was established in 1994, uh, and it started to report to the Commission on Status of Women in 2007, thereby establishing this important link between the work of this independent mandate and Human Rights Council and the CSW. I hope that this cooperation could be further deepened and strengthened, uh, especially with respect to the implementation of country-specific recommendations on the elimination of violence against women. I would also like to mention as a positive development that due to increasing recognition of gender mainstreaming, a number of special procedures mandate holders started to develop the work done by their mandates from a gender perspective. Mr. Chairperson, my mandate has noted that violence against women and girls remains universal, widespread, systematic, and structural, and its fight is still likely to be marginalized at the national level because of the existence of the large implementation gap, and also lack of holistic and comprehensive approach to combat and prevent violence against women. Throughout my mandate, I will strive to contribute to the reduction of this gap and acceptance of violence as a way of life. I will strongly promote and support states and non-governmental organizations to uphold the rights of every woman to right free, free from violence in this world. I believe that my mandate has an important role to play in promoting synergies between the existing international and regional instruments and systems on violence against women. I had already had a meeting with Gravio, monitoring body established under the Istanbul Convention, and would like to con connect and continue with meetings with other regional monitoring mechanisms. I would also like to strengthen engagement between my mandate and the CEDAW Committee and other relevant treaty bodies. As a former CEDO committee member familiar with its work and jurisprudence in the area of violence against women, I intend to focus on cooperation and synergies between these two independent accountability mechanisms. I had already had a meeting with CEDO committee to discuss such cooperation that has now started, as was mentioned by the chairperson of the CEDO committee, Ms. Yoko Hayashi, expert group meeting on updating the general recommendation number 19 was convened and I was invited to provide input into the draft that will provide um, new interpretation of global standards on violence against women. I would also like to use this opportunity to call all United Nations member states and all stakeholders to provide me with their views and proposals on any actions needed to improve the current framework on addressing violence against women and girls, and also to look into declaration on the elimination of violence against women and its call for development of specific guidelines for its implementation as an avenue for stronger implementation that could be done by this commission. Mr. Chairperson, um, last month I had opportunity to observe the last day of hearing of an emblematic trial of the Serpuzarko case which marked the first case where crimes committed against women, including sexual slavery, during an armed conflict, conflict were prosecuted in the country. Uh, this case that was uh, done in Guatemala is also a lesson that could be important for all other countries and cases that still await such a trial. Mr. Chairperson, UNICEF has indicated last month for the first time since the start of the refugee and migrant crisis in Europe, there are more children and women on the move than adult males. These women and girls are vulnerable at all stages of their journey in countries of origin, transit, and destination. And this large-scale phenomenon of female migration has yet to be adequately addressed. My mandate stands ready to assist in development of necessary guidelines for states in this field. Um, in my uh, future work, I'll also plan to look at the prevention of violence against women as a part of the mandate that deals with elimination of root causes and consequences of violence. I will look at provisions of adequate services for survivors of violence, shelters, crisis centers, and prevention and protection orders. Looking more closely at the mechanisms for prevention of violence against women, I would also like to highlight 
the existence of a major barriers in preventing femicides or gender-related killing of women. Uh, last year, on 25th November, I have called all states to establish a femicide watch or gender-related killing of women watch in order to publish and collect data on femicides and to analyze such data. Such data and their analysis would greatly contribute to prevent preventable death of women because analysis of specific cases on gender-related killing can contribute to identify failure in protection in view of improving and developing preventive measures. Mr. Chairperson, I would like to briefly mention that uh, last week I have participated at fifth Kigali International Conference uh, on the role of security organs to end violence against women. It started with 12 member states, but now 43 African states are taking part in implementation of this declaration, which calls, among other commitments, states to recruit and promote more women officers in all echelons of security organs. I intend to look into possibility of elaboration of a global code of conduct for security forces dealing with violence against women and girls. Uh, since I took my function, I have conducted an official visit to South Africa uh, in December last year and to Georgia in February this year. I would like to thank governments for their uh, cooperation during my visit. I am also pleased to announce that I have received positive replies to conduct a visits to Australia and Bulgaria. I am still awaiting uh, confirmation from Mauritania. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. I thank the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, its causes and consequences for her statement. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I now invite the Commission to begin its general discussion of Agenda Item 3. Let me remind all delegations of the allotted time for statements, 10 minutes for groups, and 5 minutes for national statements. And I apologize beforehand if I have to interrupt speakers, but I hope that this will not be necessary with your kind cooperation. I will now give the floor to the first speaker on my list, His Excellency Mr. Adul Sansinkeo, Minister of Social Development and Human Security of Thailand on behalf of the Group of 77 and China. ในนามของกลุ่มเจ็ดเจ็ดและจีนผมรู้สึกเป็นเกียรติอย่างยิ่งที่ได้กล่าวทั้งแหล่งในการประชุมครั้งนั้นการว่าด้วยสภาพสต
เข้ากับเป้าหมายนั้นอื่นๆที่กำหนดไว้อย่างไม่เคยมีมาก่อนกลุ่มจุเจตจีนบุ่งมั่นที่จะนำเป้าหมายกำลังที่ยั่งยืนมาพนวกกับเจนวงทางการเมืองของเราในการส่งเสริมความเสือภาคระหว่างเพศและการส่งสร้างความเข้มแข็งของตีเพื่อนำสู่การบรรลุเป้าหมายอันสูงสุดคือการไม่ทิ้งใครไว้เบื้องหลังท่านประธานที่กรบในมุมมองของเราการเสริมสร้างความเข้มแข็งของสตรีนั้นเป็นพื้นฐานที่เชื่อมโยงกับการอย่างยั่งยืนโดยที่มีเป้าหมายการพัฒนาที่ยั่งยืนคอสอวันสามสิบต้องการที่จะขจัดความยากจนขจัดความไม่เท่าเทียมทางสังคมในเรื่องรายได้และเศรษฐกิจควบคู่ไปกับการให้โอกาสที่เท่าเทียมโดยเฉพาะในแง่เศรษฐกิจบนโลกใบนี้ที่มีความสมดุลความยั่งยืนของสิ่งแวดล้อมอันดีสุขและความมั่งคั่งดูเป็นเรื่องยากที่จะเมินการให้เกิดขึ้นได้หากประชากรครึ่งหนึ่งของโลกยังไม่สามารถเข้าถึงบริการพื้นฐานขาดโอกาสการเข้าถึงปัจจัยทางเศรษฐกิจและทรัพยากรแม้หลายประเทศมีความก้าวหน้าในการเมินการเข้าสู่เสมอภาคระหว่างเพศและการเสริมสร้างความเข้มแข็งของสตรีตามที่กำหนดไว้ในเป้าหมายนาแห่งศตวรรษแต่กลุ่มเจตจีนยังมีความห่วงใยในความก้าวหน้าของการเมินงานด้านสตรีและเด็กหญิงที่ค่อนข้างช้าและไม่สนเสมอโดยเฉพาะอย่างยิ่งในสภาพการปัจจุบันที่ประเทศกาลังพัฒนาต้องเผชิญกับการแก้ไขปัญหาความยากจนอีกทั้งในด้านความมั่นคงโดยเฉพาะปัญหาที่ตีต้องเผชิญกับการถูกเลือกปฏิบัติด้วยเหตุที่มีฐานะเป็นผู้โยกย้ายถิ่นฐานมีความแตกต่างทางชาติพันธุ์ความพิการรวมถึงสตรีและเด็กที่ติดเชื้อ s อ v อยู่ในภาะสงครามความขัดแย้งยึดพื้นที่คลองหรือในความสภาพที่ถูกควบคามที่ขัดต่อหลักกฎหมายสากลยังมีความก้าวหน้าที่เป็นที่น่าพอใจนักในการนี้เราขอแสดงความชื่นชมต่อรายงานเรื่องสถานการณ์และความช่วยเหลือต่อสตรีปัสตายของสัตวชาติสตรียังคงเป็นผู้ที่เปราะบางขาดโอกาสทั้งเรื่องการเข้าถึงการบริการสาธารณสุขการศึกษาและสิทธิจะได้รับความคุ้มครองทางสังคมเพื่อคุณภาพที่ดีและมีรายได้ที่เพียงพอสตรีชนบทถือว่าเป็นผู้ที่มีบทบาทอย่างมากในกำนาชนบทที่จะต้องได้รับการสนุนนอกจากนี้ปัญหาการคำนุดซึ่งมีสตรีและเด็กหญิงจำนวนมากตกเป็นเหยื่อและปัญหาการกระทำความแรงต่อตัวเนื้อตัวร่างกายสตรีรวมถึงการทำลายประเภทสงวนของสตรีเราต้องได้รับการแก้ไขเนื่องจากปัญหาที่กล่าวมานั้นเป็นความรุนแรงต่อสตรีที่ร้ายแรงและละเมิดสิทธิสตรีและสิทธิเด็กหญิงซึ่งไม่ควรยอมให้เกิดขึ้นโดยเหตุนี้การดําเนินการภายใต้กรอบกฎหมายอย่างจริงจังจะช่วยสตรีที่ตกเป็นเหยื่อได้รับความคุ้มครองและความสุธรรมต่อไปท่านประธานที่เคารพการประชุมคณะกรรมการว่าด้วยสารภาพสตรีวันที่60ถือเป็นโอกาสอันดีที่เราได้จัดการกับปัญหาต่างๆอย่างครอบคลุมและครบถ้วนโดยมีจุดมุ่งหมายสำคัญคือการดำเนินการตามแนวทางเพื่อเร่งรัดกำนาความเสือภาคระหว่างเพศและการส่งเสริมความเข้มแข็งของสตรีภายใต้เป้าหมาย2030เพื่อการพัฒนาที่ยั่งยืนกลุ่มเจเจ็ดและจีนเห็นด้วยกับท่านเลขาธิการสภาชาติว่าเราจําเป็นที่ต้องเปลี่ยนแปลงเราขอเน้นย้ําความสําคัญของการแสดงจารมทางการเมืองและการเมืองการตามนโยบายด้านศาสนาที่จะต้องสอดรับกับการสนุนความเสมอภาคระหว่างเพศการคํานึงถึงการจัดทำงบประมาณที่คํานึงถึงมิติหญิงชายและความสําคัญของการบริหารจัดการทรัพยากรที่สนุนความที่เป็นผู้นําสตรีเพื่อรับการประกันว่าสตรีและเด็กหญิงก็เป็นส่วนหนึ่งของสังคมและการมีส่วนร่วมในสังคมทั้งด้านเศรษฐกิจและการเมืองเราขอเน้นย้ำว่าความเสือภาคระหว่างเพศไม่ใช่เพียงแค่หญิงและสตรีแต่เป็นเรื่องของบุรุษเช่นเดียวกันดังนั้นบุรุษต้องเข้ามีส่วนร่วมในการแก้ปัญหาสตรีและหญิงก็เป็นผู้นำการเปลี่ยนแปลงเช่นเดียวกัน
ดังนั้นจึงต้องได้รับการสนับสนุนโดยเฉพาะเมื่อเราต้องการบรรลุเป้าหมายกำหนดที่ยั่งยืนโซน30ท่านประธานที่เคารพการเปลี่ยนแปลงเป็นสิ่งจําเป็นเพราะเป้าหมายกำหนดที่ยั่งยืนนั้นเป็นเป้าหมายที่ถูกหนดให้สูงกว่าที่ผ่านๆมาเป้าหมายยิ่งสูงย่อมเกิดผลลัพธ์และผลสําเร็จมากขึ้นเพื่อก้าวไปสู่ความสําเร็จกลุ่มเจ็ดและจีนขอเน้นย้ำความสําคัญของความร่วมมือระหว่างประเทศและการเป็นหุ้นส่วนในระดับนานาชาติซึ่งเป็นกุญแจสําคัญในการบรรลุความส่งเสริมความเสือภาคระหว่างเพศและการสร้างเสริมความเข้มแข็งของสตรีรวมถึงการบรรลุพันธสัญญาหรือข้อตกลงทางการต่างๆในเรื่องการให้ความช่วยเหลือด้านพัฒนาและลดหนี้สินการเปิดตลาดเสรีการสนุนทางด้านงบประมาณและด้านเทคนิคและกำลังศักยภาพในทุกภาคส่วนเพื่อกำจัดความไม่เท่าเทียมกันและแตกต่างทางเพศในกลุ่มนี้กลุ่มเจ็ดและประเทศจีนจะมุ่งมั่นที่จะสแสวงหาภาคีความเป็นหุ้นส่วนและความพร้อมจะแลกเปลี่ยนประสบการณ์และความมุมมองในการที่จะช่วยเหลือขับเคลื่อนให้เป้าหมายถึงความยั่งยืนเกิดประโยชน์อย่างแท้จริงสุดท้ายนี้ท่านประธานที่เคารพผมขอยืนยันในจารมอันมุ่งมั่นของกลุ่มเจ็ดและจีนที่จะดำเนินการตามปฏิญญาและแผนปฏิบัติการปักกิ่งและผลการดำเนินการตามปฏิญญาปักกิ่งและแผนปฏิบัติการปักกิ่งโดยเฉพาะอย่างยิ่งข้อท้าทายเร่งด่วน12ประเด็นที่ยังไม่ประสบความสําเร็จจากผลการประชุมสมัชชาใหญ่แห่งประชาติครั้งที่23กลุ่มเจ็ดและจีนขอยืนยันความสําคัญของการมีส่วนร่วมของประเทศสมาชิกที่จะต้องดําเนินการตามพันธกรณีระหว่างประเทศภายใต้นุสัญญาว่าด้วยการขจัดการเลือกปฏิบัติต่อสตรีในทุกรูปแบบขอให้เราใช้โอกาสนี้ในการทํางานร่วมกันเพื่อไปสู่ความสําเร็จที่มีประสิทธิผลผมขอขอบคุณครับขอบคุณมากครับท่านI have the honor to speak on behalf of the African Group on the theme "Women's Empowerment and its Link to Sustainable Development." The African Group aligns its statement with the statement delivered by the delegation of Thailand on behalf of the G77 in China. The African Group thanks the Secretary General for the reports under this agenda item and takes note of the recommendations contained in them. Chairperson. The full and effective implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action is a foundation for sustainable development and other international agreements that promote women's empowerment and compliance with the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The adoption of Sustainable Development 2030 Agenda reaffirmed the commitment of the government, the international community. And all stakeholders to act in partnership to combat poverty. The global community pledged to implement the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and committed to take bold and transformative steps required to shift the world into a sustained and resilient path. They, they reaffirmed the importance of working with women who are forced to bear the brunt of the consequences. Of climate change and are systematically excluded from decision-making mechanisms and are denied opportunities in deciding when and how to overcome the vulnerabilities they face. Indeed, women's contributions to both adaptation and mitigation efforts at all levels and across all sectors remain not an option but a necessity. Chairperson, climate change is a global challenge. That burdens all humanities, though not equally. The world's poor, the majority of whom are women, 
are affected disproportionately. As the world continues to struggle to grapple with rapid onset disaster, as well as respond to continuing degradation caused by climate change, it is critical to ensure that the plight of women is firmly on the global agenda and that women from different backgrounds are able to lead in negotiations and participate in the design and implementation of programs and resilient efforts. The responsibility for addressing climate change falls on us all. We must lead our respective arenas and work across sectors to forge partnership and foster collaboration through efforts that are sensitive to the needs and experiences of women, bearing in mind their capabilities and giving credit to their potentials. While greater inclusion of women at the highest level of decision making relating to climate change is necessary, it is not sufficient. Women must be able to lead at national and local levels. Their initiatives, indigenous knowledge, and perspective can inform and influence solutions to climate change. Chairperson, disaster, many of which are fueled by climate change, are increasing in frequency and intensity. These significantly impede progress toward sustainable development. While Africa is not responsible for the pollution and the factors causing, causing climate change, it stands to suffer most. The region is the most vulnerable to climate change, given its low capacity to adapt and respond economically, politically, and geographically. The African Common Position on Post-2015 Development Agenda reaffirms the cooperation of the African leadership with the Rio Plus 20 outcome. African countries have shown in their initially determined contributions and disease a strong commitment to adhere to the mitigation target as set in the Paris Agreement. We appeal to our partners to fulfill their finance climate commitment and long-standing resources to support commitments which are essential for Africa's national, national determined contributions, adaptation, and mitigation plans, and to also reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. It is time to act collectively if we want to achieve a truly inclusive, sustainable development. We must support and comply with Paris Agreement. Chairperson, Africa, re Africa relies heavily on agriculture and tourism. Agriculture continues to predominantly provide employment opportunities for women. Women often lack right to land, resources, and technical inputs to fully exploit and diversify their products. Their lack of access to land, lack of access to international markets, agricultural technologies, and financial capital hinders opportunities to diversify their livelihoods or increase the resiliency in the face of climate change. While adaptation actions have to follow a country-driven, gender-responsible, participatory, and full transparent approach, taking into consideration vulnerable groups and ecosystems, it is imperative to strengthen international cooperation towards the conclusion of the Doha rounds of negotiations of the World Trade Organization. We ask our development partners to support the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, a flagship project of Agenda 2063 of the African Union. We believe that supporting private sector development and entrepreneurship will boost sustained economic growth, social equality and equity, protected environment, and gender equality and women's empowerment in Africa. Chairperson, on the other hand, we applaud the commitment undertaken in the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030 to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services, including family planning, information, and education. It provides an ideal framework for eco acceleration of the pace of progress made in fighting malaria, HIV, AIDS, HIV and AIDS, TB, and other communicable epidemics and non-communicable diseases. We welcome research and innovation efforts, including development of vaccines to prevent, treat, and cure these diseases. The disease burden in Africa hinders women's progress and time to engage in activities that will empower and develop them. 
we believe that achieving universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care services, and access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all could be attainable if proper set standards and education on the distribution of medication are adhered to. Chairperson, we should effectively address the interlinkages among the social, economic, and environmental dimensions of sustainable development. Institutions and capacities should be strengthened in order to foster policy integration at all levels. We call on our partners to assist in building infrastructure and communication means, increase foreign direct investment and transfer of technology on mutually agreed terms in the climate change adaptation and mitigation needs of Africa. A global governance framework that balances the issues of adaptation, mitigation, provides adequate financing, as well as technology development and transfer remain paramount to Africa's development needs. It is important to ensure that we will not only mitigate and adapt to climate change, but also do so in a manner that builds African capacities, researchers, institutions, and most importantly, to ensure that these initiatives contribute towards development on the continent, creating the much needed jobs and resilience for our communities and women. Coherent socioeconomic and environmental policies need to be formulated to promote green jobs in the labor intensive sectors on which disadvantaged social groups and communities, especially women, depend on their livelihood. Chairperson, in concluding, we are convinced that the true merit of 2030 sustainable development agenda rests on its implementation. We reaffirm our support to sustainable development agenda 2030 and the Addis Ababa action agenda and their implementation line with NIPAD and African Union agenda 2063 priorities. We are of the, of the view that this session's outcome will put more emphasis on tangible recommendations which are essential in promoting Africa's, African women's empowerment, development, and resilience so that no one is left behind in the implementation of the sustainable development goals and other internationally agreed development initiatives and framework so that sustainable development becomes a reality. I thank you very much, Chairperson. I thank the Minister for Health, Community Development, Gender, Elderly, and Children of the United Republic of Tanzania on behalf of the African Group, and I next give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Yet Busemaker, Minister of Education, Culture, and Science of the Netherlands, who will be speaking on behalf of the European Union. Mr. Chair, I have the honor of addressing on behalf of the European Union and its member states the Commission on the Status of Women. 2015 will be remembered as a milestone for gender equality with the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action, with the 15th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. And a milestone for sustainable development with the adoption of the 21st 30 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The EU welcomes the commitments to gender equality, empowerment of all women and girls, and the full realization of their human rights taken with the 2030 Agenda, including the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. We also applaud the inclusion of violence against women and girls in the 2030 Agenda. This is a clear recognition that violence against women and girls is a violation of human rights and the most extreme form of gender discrimination. The elimination of violence against women is a prerequisite for sustainable development. This comes 20 years after the Beijing Platform for Action identified violence against women as an area of concern. It was time. 
the EU remains committed to the promotion, protection and fulfillment of all human rights and to the full and effective implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action and the program of action of the ICPD and the outcomes of their review conferences. We remain committed to sexual and reproductive health and rights in this context. Having that in mind, we reaffirm the EU's commitment to the promotion, protection and fulfillment of the right of every individual to have full control over and decide freely and responsibly on matters related to their sexuality and sexual and reproductive rights, free from discrimination, coercion and violence. We further stress the need for universal access to equality and affordable, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health information, including comprehensive education, including comprehensive sexuality education and healthcare services. The EU position is also guided by the principles of the EU implementation of the United Nations Security Council resolutions. 1325, as well as by subsequent resolutions, including 2242-2015. Mr. Chair, it is now time to implement what we promised. We have three leading messages in relation to the outcomes of this session. The agreed conclusions and the multi-annual work program. First, we reaffirm that gender equality needs to be at the core when implementing the new 2030 Agenda if we want to be successful. Second, we need to fully implement SDG 5. We need to fully implement a gender equality perspective into all goals, targets and indicators and across the Agenda. There cannot be any exception. Third, we reaffirm the centrality of the Beijing Platform for Action in the realization of the 2030 Agenda. These processes are mutually supportive and equally important. Our task as this CSW and beyond is to define the synergies and coherence between the two. Mr. Chair, in the EU, EU we have promoted gender equality through a mix of legislation, policy measures and funding. We have transformed the differences between our countries into opportunities and strengths. The EU has also provided its partners with the effective support they need in order to empower women and girls and to fight violence. Despite this, data show that gender inequalities and discrimination still persist in all spheres of life in the EU. To accelerate progress, we need a strong boost, and this is what we renewed commitment to the Beijing platform and the new 2030 agenda gives us. Allow me to share some EU thoughts on the main strands of action proposed in the draft agreed conclusion. First, we need to strengthen the normative, legal and policy frameworks. There are no cultural, traditional, religi religious and other beliefs that can justify the persistence of discriminatory laws against girls and women. It is the duty of the states to ensure that equal rights between women and men in all spheres of life are enshrined in legislation and become a reality. The EU calls all countries that have not yet done so to sign, ratify and fully implement the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Second, we need to enhance national but also international institutional arrangements. National gender equality mechanisms must participate in the national implementation, follow-up and monitoring of the 2030 Agenda. We need to give them a clear mandate, power and necessary resources. We also need a strong commitment to gender equality into all policy areas. The realization of the SDG 5 and gender mainstreaming cannot be solely the solely responsibility of gender equality mechanisms, but is a collective effort. This is also valid at international level. 
The promotion of gender equality and women's empowerment must be a central aim of the United Nations. And we support the key role that UN Women plays in empowering women and eliminating all forms of violence against women and girls. Third, we need an enabling environment for financing gender equality and women's empowerment. The EU history shows that women's access to employment and economic empowerment remains a key factor to ensure that no one is left behind. Our history also shows that the right to equal access is not enough. As an example, we need to develop the infrastructures that help women and men to balance their work and private life. And we need to create the right conditions for men to take up and share equally family and care responsibilities. Fourth, we need to strengthen women's leadership and support women's society organizations. For the EU, it is of paramount importance to strengthen civil society organizations' roles and advocates for gender equality and women's empowerment in the 2030 Agenda, support their capacities to hold governments to account for their commitments, and facilitate networking with other actors at local, national, regional and international levels. Finally, and fifth, we need to strengthen gender-responsive data collection, follow-up and review monitoring and accountability processes. It is crucial that we are able to effectively assess progress made in achieving SDG 5 as well as gender mainstreaming across the agenda by ensuring that indicators and data are, are disaggregated by sex and age. We also need to increase efforts to fill the data cap on violence against women and girls. For this reason, at EU level, we are building the foundations of an EU-wide survey on gender-based violence. Mr. Chair, during this session, we will also discuss the multi-annual work program of the CSW. The Commission work must reflect and develop synergies with the global efforts for sustainable developments and the 2030 Agenda. We shall not forget that the CSW primary goal is to promote and achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women, and to deliver what was promised in Beijing and what we all recommitted to last year. Only by implementing these two processes, the 2030 Agenda and the Beijing Platform for Action, we can be successful. Let me end with what the EU considers the overarching issue for this session and all other sessions of this Commission. We have agreed that the 2030 Agenda is people-centered, based on human rights, and combats discrimination, including gender equality and gender-based violence. When we secure all the human rights of all women and girls in all their diversity, we are not only investing in equal, equitable, and progressive societies, we are also an uptapping the potential of half of the world's population. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister of Education, Culture, and Science of the Netherlands for her statement. Y doy ahora la palabra a su excelencia, la señora Alejandrina Germán, Ministra de la Situación de la Mujer de la República Dominicana, que hablará en nombre de la Comunidad de Países Latinoamericanos y del Caribe. Tiene la palabra. Tengo el honor de hablar a nombre de la Comunidad de Estados Latinoamericanos y Caribeños, CELAC. La Comunidad de Estados Latinoamericanos y Caribeños celebra la decisión de seleccionar para el sexagésimo periodo de sesiones de la, com de la Comisión de la Comisión Jurídica Social de la Mujer como tema prioritario el empoderamiento de la mujer y su relación con el desarrollo sostenible y realizar una revisión de los avances en la implementación de las conclusiones acordadas en el 57 séptimo periodo de sesiones de la CSW con el tema eliminación y prevención de todas las formas de violencia contra las mujeres y niñas y le agradece por los informes presentados para esta sesión por el Secretario General, así como por las recomendaciones contenidas en el mismo. 
Reafirmamos también la importancia de la aplicación plena y efectiva de, de la Declaración de Beijing y su plataforma de acción, así como de los resultados de la vigésimo tercera sesión extraordinaria de la Asamblea General. Reafirmamos también la importancia de que los estados que forman parte cumplan plenamente sus obligaciones internacionales en virtud de la Convención Internacional sobre la Eliminación de Todas las Formas de Discriminación contra la Mujer y su Protocolo Facultativo. Los países de la CELA están fuertemente comprometidos con la igualdad de género y el empoderamiento de la mujer, así como con promover, proteger y respetar todos los derechos humanos y las libertades fundamentales de las mujeres y las niñas, incluyendo el derecho al desarrollo, que son universales, indivisibles, interdependientes e interrelacionados, sin discriminación de ningún tipo. Es el deber de los Estados, independientemente de su política económica y sistema cultural, promover y proteger todos los derechos humanos y libertades fundamentales, así como se expresa en la Declaración de Viena y en el Programa de Acción adoptado por la Conferencia Mundial sobre Derechos Humanos. El logro del disfrute pleno y equitativo de todos los derechos humanos y libertades fundamentales de las mujeres y las niñas es una prioridad para los gobiernos y las Naciones Unidas y es esencial para el avance de la mujer. La comunidad internacional ha progresado mucho desde la adopción de la declaración de Beijing, su plataforma de acción y de la Convención sobre la Eliminación de Todas las Formas de Discriminación contra la Mujer. Sin embargo, debemos tener en cuenta qué tan lejos estamos todavía de alcanzar todas esas metas y compromisos, en particular la igualdad entre mujeres y hombres. Asimismo, reafirmamos los compromisos internacionales asumidos en las relevantes cumbres y conferencias de las Naciones Unidas en el área de la igualdad de género y el empoderamiento de la mujer, incluyendo el programa de acción de la Conferencia Internacional sobre Población y Desarrollo, el Cairo 1994, y sus medidas clave para implementarlo. Y por tanto, estamos comprometidos a fortalecer los marcos políticos y jurídicos, así como a mejorar el apoyo a los mecanismos nacionales para el desarrollo de la mujer. Señor Presidente, la condición jurídica y social de la mujer es motivo de constante preocupación para nuestras sociedades, en particular debido a la feminización de la pobreza, la violencia de género, la discriminación, el acceso a la capacitación y la educación, el acceso desigual a los recursos económicos y financieros, la desigualdad de acceso y uso de los recursos sanitarios básicos, las desigualdades en las políticas de empleo y con el agravante del trabajo no remunerado, incluido el cuidado y el trabajo doméstico con los niños, las personas mayores y las que sufren de enfermedades tanto transmisibles como no transmisibles. Se trata de mujeres y niñas que ha creado una carga desproporcionada para las mujeres, así como las desigualdades estructurales que perpetúan el ciclo de la pobreza, la marginalidad y la desigualdad. Reafirmamos la importancia de erradicar la pobreza en todas sus formas y dimensiones, incluyendo la pobreza extrema, enfrentando sus causas estructurales, económicas, sociales y políticas y garantizar la igualdad de acceso para todas las mujeres como conductoras del desarrollo sostenible a los recursos económicos y productivos, a los servicios de, de apoyo, a la participación de la mujer en el proceso de toma de decisiones, incluso en las áreas de vivienda, alimentación y educación, oportunidades y servicios públicos, en particular los servicios de salud. Nosotras reconocemos que los esfuerzos de desarrollo sostenible tienen que contribuir al total beneficio de mujeres y niñas. Es de suma importancia que todas las mujeres y niñas sean incluidas como beneficiarias del desarrollo sostenible sin discriminación de ningún tipo. Existe la necesidad de promover la participación activa y plena de la mujer, así como la igualdad de oportunidades para el liderazgo en todos los niveles de la toma de decisiones gubernamentales, aumentando su representación en la administración pública, especialmente en los más altos niveles del gobierno. El compromiso y las acciones para promover la participación de las mujeres en los procesos de toma de decisiones a los niveles más altos en los sectores públicos, económicos, culturales, sociales y ambientales deberían tener mayor prioridad en las agendas nacionales, regionales e internacionales. 
Por consiguiente, reiteramos nuestro compromiso de unir esfuerzos y continuar combatiendo todas las formas de violencia contra las mujeres y las niñas, incluyendo el feminicidio, la mutilación genital, los matrimonios forzados, la trata de personas y la violencia resultante del tráfico de drogas y sexual y otro tipo de explotación y discriminación con las mujeres y niñas así como promover sus derechos humanos, generando las condiciones necesarias para su desarrollo, fortaleciendo los espacios públicos y privados donde sea necesario, tanto a nivel nacional como internacional, a fin de que puedan mejorar sus capacidades y recibir atención médica de calidad, educación, igualdad de oportunidades para la participación política y protección contra la violencia de género e iniciación de procesos que faciliten el ejercicio pleno de los derechos humanos y el fortalecimiento de su, de su autonomía económica, incluida la promoción de su integración en diferentes sectores productivos. Señor Presidente, la CELAP también está preocupada y reconoce la situación de vulnerabilidad de las mujeres que sufren múltiples e interrelacionadas formas de discriminación, como las mujeres migrantes, campesinas e indígenas, las mujeres con discapacidad, las mujeres mayores y las mujeres de ascendencia africana. Nuestros países acordaron intensificar los esfuerzos para desarrollar todo el potencial de las, de las mujeres y las niñas, enfrentando la violencia y la discriminación contra ellas, que además de ser discriminada por ser mujeres, también enfrentan la discriminación como resultado de factores adicionales como la raza, la edad, el idioma, el origen étnico, la cultura, la religión y la discapacidad, entre otros. Los Estados miembros de la CELAC conceden una especial importancia a la protección de las mujeres y las niñas de las familias migrantes, la contribución de las trabajadoras migrantes al desarrollo de sus países de destino y de origen debe ser plenamente reconocida. Los derechos humanos de las mujeres migrantes deben ser totalmente respetados independientemente de su estatus legal. Estamos comprometidos a intensificar las medidas para prevenir y combatir la trata de personas, entre ellas el contrabando, la explotación de los migrantes en todas sus formas y garantizar la protección y el cuidado de las víctimas de estos delitos con especial atención en mujeres, niños, niñas y adolescentes. Al mismo tiempo, hacemos un llamado a los estados a establecer y fortalecer los puntos focales apropiados de coordinación para combatir estos crímenes entre los países de origen, tránsito y destino. La CELAT reafirma la importancia de mejorar y fortalecer el acceso de la mujer a la educación de calidad en todos los niveles, a los servicios de salud, incluyendo la atención primaria, la salud materna, la salud sexual y salud reproductiva acceso al empleo productivo y decente, incluyendo la eliminación de barreras para mujeres y hombres a la igual, en igualdad de condiciones en el lugar de trabajo, así como la igualdad de remuneración por igual trabajo, la protección social y el empoderamiento y autonomía económica. Enfatizamos la necesidad de promulgar leyes y adoptar reformas que den a la mujer igualdad de derechos sobre los recursos económicos y productivos, como el acceso a la propiedad y el control de la tierra y otra forma de propiedad, los derechos de herencia, los recursos naturales, incluyendo los servicios financieros, como el acceso al crédito y la mejora en el uso de las nuevas tecnologías de la información y las comunicaciones que sean apropiadas para promover el empoderamiento de la mujer. Señor Presidente, los gobiernos de la región han establecido un grupo de trabajo sobre el avance de la mujer, con representantes de la región y la sociedad civil, y apoyados por la Comisión Económica para América Latina y el Caribe, y a ONU Mujeres, para la igualdad de género y el empoderamiento de la mujer. Este grupo de trabajo se ha reunido en San Salvador, El Salvador en el 2014, y en el 2015 se reunirá de nuevo, y en el 2015, y se reunirá de nuevo en, en 2016 en Santo Domingo, República Dominicana. En una conferencia regional sobre la mujer de América Latina y el Caribe, que se celebró en República Dominicana en octubre de 2013, se adoptó el consenso de Santo Domingo, que ratificó un conjunto de compromisos asumidos por los estados en los últimos 20 años y que constituye la política de la mujer y la agenda de los derechos de la mujer en la región. Una consulta regional para América Latina y el Caribe también se llevó a cabo en México en febrero de 2014, donde se examinaron los avances en el cumplimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo del milenio. También nos gustaría destacar que la 53 tercera reunión de los presidentes de la Mesa Directiva de la Conferencia Regional sobre la Mujer de América Latina y el Caribe, reunida en Santiago de Chile del 26 al 29 de enero de 2016, con la participación de altos funcionarios de nuestra región, este evento fue convocado conjuntamente.
Le pido um, que concluya su intervención. Sí, sí. Manifiestan su firme compromiso con la promoción de la equidad, la igualdad y la autonomía de la mujer. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Agradezco a la ministra Alejandrina Germán de República Dominicana por su intervención en nombre de CELAC. And I give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Dawn Hastings Williams, Minister of the Ministry of Communities of Guyana on behalf of the Caribbean community. Mr. Chair, I am honored to speak on behalf of the 14 member states of the Caribbean community, CARICOM at the 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. 2015 marked the historic adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Important milestones in the international community's quest for sustainable development. We recognize that in the context of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, we must examine the intersection of issues, particularly as gender equality and the empowerment of women is cross-cutting and paramount to achieving sustainable development, including the reduction of poverty. Mr. Chair, CARICOM member states are committed at the highest political level to advance gender equality and women's empowerment. As reflected in the revised Treaty of the Chagaramas, Article 17, and also in their individual commitments to MDGs. The Beijing Platform and to CEDA, we remain committed to meeting our targets and indicators on stre to strengthening gender equality machineries to effectively provide the technical and policy support necessary to advance gender equality and women's empowerment across CARICOM. CARICOM has played an important role in advancing gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls through regional coordination, technical support, drafting of model legislation, research, and data collection. Our region continues to make great strides, particularly in the areas of mainstreaming a gender perspective in policy development and programs, enhancing education and training opportunities for women and girls, increasing the participation of women in leadership positions and decision making, reducing infant and maternal mortality and the spread of HIV, and facilitating access to sexual and reproductive health care. One of the successes in the Caribbean over the past three decades has been the establishment of national women's machineries to implement programs and policies to advance the status of women. Since Beijing, these national machineries have focused on gender mainstreaming and establishing multi-sectoral gender focal points throughout government agencies to ensure that gender equality perspectives are reflected in all policies and programs. Significant gains in the social and economic status of women and girls have been realized contributing to the reduction in inequalities between women and men. Credit must also be extended to the strong contributions made by civil society organizations, as well as the ongoing support and collaboration with UN agencies such as UN Women, UNFPA, UNICEF, and UNDP. During the past 10 years, higher levels of female participation in the workforce were recorded in the Bahamas, Barbados, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines and are directly linked to more women becoming qualified at the tertiary level. 
Seven countries have closed the gender gap on health and survival, and the Bahamas and Guyana have also fully closed the gap on educational attainment. Significant progress has also been made in the education sector, where many Caribbean countries are experiencing increased enrollment at the primary level. All Caribbean countries continue to provide universal and equal access to education to both boys and girls at the primary and secondary levels, including health and family life education. Many countries have also enacted legislation to ensure that women and men have equal access to microfinancing and property rights. In addition, countries have been working with the ILO to promote the decent work agenda to affirm fundamental rights for workers, especially those most vulnerable, such as domestic workers. Mr. Chair, women's contribution to the growth and development of our economies is receiving greater attention by Caribbean governments. In the context of the CSME, these include gender stereotyping and discrimination in the workforce, the lack of equal political representation, poverty, and violence against women. Within our region, there is significant unemployment and underemployment existing along with acute skill shortages in some key sectors of our economies. This social reality has resulted in a high proportion of female-headed households, placing women at a significant disadvantage to attain greater economic autonomy. Nearly half of all households in the Caribbean are headed by women, with females tending to be concentrated than their male counterparts in more paying jobs and as provi providers of unpaid work domestic and caring roles. The lack of access to technology by many of our young people has the potential to widen employment and poverty gaps. We need to broaden offerings within our general education system to provide valuable life skills, to promote entrepreneurship and foster creativity and innovation to formulate new career pathways. An area of particular concern in the Caribbean is gender-based violence. According to the 2012 Caribbean Human Development Report, while women are less likely than men to be victims of crimes generally, their vulnerability to sexual assault and domestic violence is dramatically higher than men's. Our countries have developed legislation and public policy to protect victims, sanction perpetrators, and criminalize various acts of physical, psychological, and sexual violence. To address the lack of reliable data on the prevalence of gender-based violence in the region, CARICOM is working with UN Women to develop a regional model of national prevalence surveys, which will be to inform policy and program for more effective GBV response and prevention. The rising prevalence NCDs, NCDS, in addition to the high rates of adolescent pregnancy, the fight against HIV and AIDS, and the ongoing changes in population dynamics due to aging and migration continue to challenge the region. The recent completion of the integrated strategic framework for the reduction of adolescent pregnancy in the region to be considered in accordance with national laws and policies is an important instrument for reducing the risk of adolescent pregnancy and HIV amongst youth. In particular, adolescent girls who are increasingly vulnerable and often unable to complete their education. In the Caribbean, despite some progress and a long history of political engagement, strong education and dedicated public service, Caribbean women's levels of participation in the elected and appointed positions emerges 19.4%. Trinidad and Tobago has achieved 
in both levels of parliament, while Guyana has achieved 34% female representation in its parliament. In addition, Suriname has initiated a national policy dialogue to raise public awareness around the introduction of a quota system. Further work lies ahead for the region. Mr. Chair, in conclusion, member states of CARICOM wish to reiterate their commitment to goal number five and to an integration of a gender perspective throughout the 2030 sustainable development as a whole. We will work to ensure that at the regional level, all critical areas which require attention to foster equality between men and women, as well as the empowerment and the advancement of women and girls are addressed. We look forward to collaborating with member states, UN women and other UN agencies, and civil society partners to achieve the goal of gender equality and the empowerment of women in all its aspects. I thank you. I thank the Minister of the Ministry of Communities of Guyana, who spoke on behalf of CARICOM for her statement. And I now give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Pham Thi Hai Chu Yen, Minister of Labor, Invalids, and Social Affairs of Vietnam, who will be speaking on behalf of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Thưa Ngài Chủ Tọa, Tôi rất vinh dự được phát biểu thay mặt 10 nước ASEAN gồm Brunei, Campuchia, Indonesia, Lào, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thái Lan và Việt Nam. ASEAN đồng quan điểm được nêu trong bài phát biểu của Thái Lan thay mặt nhóm G77 và Trung Quốc. Thưa Ngài Chủ tọa, đã nhiều thập kỷ kể từ khi Công ước Chiro và chương trình hành động Bắc Kinh được thông qua, chúng ta một lần nữa tạo dấu ấn quan trọng khi thông qua chương trình nghị sự phát triển bền vững 2030 có một mục tiêu riêng về bình đẳng giới và trao quyền cho phụ nữ và cách tiếp cận về giới mang tính hệ thống đối với tất cả các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững. Một điểm có ý nghĩa là các chỉ tiêu trong mục tiêu số 5 cũng như các chỉ tiêu thuộc các mục tiêu khác đã thể hiện một cách toàn diện và đầy đủ những khía cạnh về giới bao gồm vấn đề đói nghèo, y tế, giáo dục, nước sạch, vệ sinh, việc làm và môi trường. Rõ ràng rằng việc đạt được những mục tiêu và chỉ tiêu nêu trên đã mang lại kết quả thực sự cho phụ nữ và trẻ em gái. Mặt khác, thực hiện bình đẳng giới và trao quyền cho phụ nữ sẽ giúp cho hoàn thành các mục tiêu phát triển bền vững. Do vậy, ASEAN cho rằng chủ đề khóa họp năm nay về trao quyền cho phụ nữ và mối liên hệ với phát triển bền vững là rất phù hợp và đúng thời điểm. Thảo luận hôm nay sẽ giúp cho chúng ta hiểu sâu hơn về mối liên kết này và từ đó có thể thực hiện chương trình nghị sự 2030 với cách tiếp cận đáp ứng yêu cầu về giới. Thưa Ngài Chủ tọa, năm 2015 cũng là một năm đáng nhớ của ASEAN. Vào tháng 12 năm 2015, các nước Đông Nam Á đã tự hào tuyên bố hình thành cộng đồng ASEAN với mục tiêu phục vụ người dân Đông Nam Á tốt hơn tất cả các lĩnh vực bao gồm cả mục tiêu không thể tách rời là bình đẳng giới và trao quyền cho phụ nữ. ASEAN sẽ tiếp tục nỗ lực trong công tác bình đẳng giới để đảm bảo quyền con người và công bằng xã hội. Chúng tôi nhận thức rõ tầm quan trọng của việc lồng ghép giới trong tất cả các lĩnh vực khác nhau của phát triển bền vững để bảo đảm cam kết và trách nhiệm chung nhằm đạt được những mục tiêu về kinh tế, xã hội và bảo vệ môi trường. Do vậy, bình đẳng giới, chấm dứt bạo lực đối với phụ nữ và trao quyền cho phụ nữ là trọng tâm của cả ba trụ cột của ASEAN, bao gồm an ninh chính trị, kinh tế và văn hóa xã hội. Chúng tôi tin tưởng rằng việc à, văn kiện ASEAN 2010, 2025 cũng vững, cùng vững vàng tiến bước, vừa được thông qua tại Hội nghị Thường đỉnh ASEAN lần thứ 27 tháng 11 năm 2015 tại Malaysia và chương trình nghị sự 2030 xã hội trợ cho nhau, giúp định hướng sự phát triển của các nước Đông Nam Á trong tất cả các lĩnh vực quan trọng, nhất là bình đẳng giới và trao quyền cho phụ nữ. Thưa Ngài Chủ tọa, ASEAN đã đạt được nhiều thành tiệu về bình đẳng giới và trao quyền cho phụ nữ, 
Những kết quả này thể hiện sự tham gia ngày càng nhiều của phụ nữ vào lực lượng lao động trong đời sống kinh tế, chính trị, xã hội, cải thiện giáo dục, tăng cường cân bằng tỷ lệ giới tính trong dân số và củng cố các cơ chế quốc gia về công tác bình đẳng giới. Cam kết của chúng tôi về giải quyết bất định, bất bình đẳng giới trong các lĩnh vực an ninh chính trị, kinh tế văn hóa xã hội thông qua lồng ghép giới đã được tái khẳng định tại hội nghị bộ trưởng phụ nữ ASEAN lần thứ hai tháng 10 năm 2015 tại Philippines. ASEAN luôn ưu tiên giải quyết vấn đề bạo lực đối với phụ nữ và trẻ em gái và đã có những bước tiến quan trọng trong những năm gần đây thông qua triển khai các hành động, chính sách cụ thể ở cả cấp khu vực và quốc gia. Nhiều nước ASEAN thông qua luật quốc gia về chống bạo lực đối với phụ nữ. Chính phủ và các tổ chức xã hội cùng nhau hỗ trợ chăm sóc những nạn nhân của bạo lực. Chúng tôi cũng quan tâm cải thiện việc thực thi quản lý pháp luật và chính sách khu vực nhằm bảo vệ phụ nữ và trẻ em gái. Gần đây, tại Hội nghị Thượng đỉnh lần thứ 27, lãnh đạo ASEAN đã thông qua kế hoạch hành động khu vực về xã, xóa bỏ bạo lực đối với phụ nữ và kế hoạch hành động khu vực về xóa bỏ bạo lực đối với trẻ em, gửi đi một thông điệp mạnh mẽ về ASEAN không khoan dung với đối với bất kỳ hình thức bạo lực đối với phụ nữ và trẻ em. Tôi rất vui mừng được thông báo rằng tại hội nghị này, lãnh đạo ASEAN cũng đã thông qua công ước ASEAN về chống buôn bán người, đặc biệt là phụ nữ và trẻ em. Đây là văn kiện pháp lý khu vực cho thấy cam kết mạnh mẽ của ASEAN trong việc phòng ngừa và đấu tranh chống buôn bán người một cách toàn diện và thống nhất. Ủy ban phụ nữ ASEAN, Ủy ban thúc đẩy và bảo vệ quyền phụ nữ và trẻ em ASEAN và Hội nghị quan chức cấp cao về phúc lợi và xã hội và phát triển tiếp tục đi đầu trong việc thúc đẩy phúc lợi và phát triển cho phụ nữ và trẻ em. Nhiều dự án gần đây được thông qua hoặc đang được thực hiện như hướng dẫn về xử lý các trường hợp phụ nữ là nạn nhân của buôn bán người, báo cáo về quyền phụ nữ, trao quyền và bình đẳng giới và hướng dẫn chia, hướng dẫn của ASEAN về cách tiếp cận không bạo lực trong việc chăm sóc, nuôi dưỡng và phát triển trẻ em. Ủy ban Liên Chính phủ về Nhân quyền ASEAN, ICHA, đã và đang thúc đẩy quyền của phụ nữ như một phần không thể tách rời của quyền con người. Năm ngoái tại Philippines, Ủy ban đã tổ chức hội nghị khu vực nhằm tăng cường sứ mệnh bảo vệ của ICHA thông qua các chiến lược và cơ chế bảo vệ phụ nữ và trẻ em gái ASEAN. Cùng với mục tiêu lồng ghép và tăng cường vai trò của phụ nữ, Viện Nghiên cứu Hòa bình và giải Hòa giải ASEAN đã tổ chức hai hội thảo tại Philippines năm 2015 về tăng cường sự tham gia của phụ nữ vào tiến trình hòa bình và hoàn cảnh của phụ nữ và trẻ em gái trong khu vực xung đột. Những hội nghị này đã thúc đẩy vấn đề phụ nữ là một trong những ưu tiên hàng đầu trong thảo luận về hòa bình an ninh. Thêm vào đó, từ khi được thành lập năm 2014, mạng lưới doanh nhân nữ ASEAN đã được đã thực sự trở thành diễn đàn cho các nữ doanh nhân của ASEAN trao đổi kiến thức, kinh nghiệm, thông tin về những chính sách, môi trường kinh doanh và cơ hội thúc đẩy vấn đề giới trong kinh doanh. Mạng lưới này đã tổ chức nhiều hội thảo và xây dựng kế hoạch hoạt động 2016-2017 và hoàn thiện sáng kiến các hành động kinh tế đáp ứng giới cho chuyển biến của phụ nữ. Đầu tháng này tại Việt Nam, mạng lưới cũng đã tổ chức lễ vinh danh các nữ doanh nhân xuất sắc của ASEAN vì sự đóng góp vào phát triển kinh tế xã hội. ASEAN đề cao vai trò quan trọng của Ủy ban Địa vị Phụ nữ như một diễn đàn để các nước tăng cường chia sẻ nhận thức, kinh nghiệm, bài học về bảo vệ và trao quyền cho phụ nữ và trẻ em gái. Chúng tôi kêu gọi Ủy ban đóng vai trò tiên phong cùng với sự tham gia phối hợp của các bên liên quan trong việc thực hiện chương trình nghị sự 2030 với cách tiếp cận đáp ứng về giới. ASEAN tái khẳng định cam kết thực hiện công ước CEDO và cương lĩnh hành động Bắc Kinh. Chúng tôi sẽ tiếp tục nỗ lực vì sự tiến bộ của phụ nữ ở cả ở cấp quốc gia và khu vực thông qua việc tăng cường hợp tác với các đối tác, đặc biệt là với Liên Hợp Quốc. Xin cảm ơn các quý vị. I thank the Minister of Labor, Invalids and Social Affairs of Vietnam. Y ahora doy la palabra a su excelencia, la señora Ana Aminta Madrid, Ministra del Instituto Nacional para las Mujeres, 
de Honduras y quien hablará en nombre del Sistema de Integración Centroamericano en la palabra. Gracias, presidente. En mi calidad de presidenta pro tempora del Consejo de Ministras de la Mujer de Centroamérica y República Dominicana, CONCA, del Sistema de Integración Centroamericana, instancia conformada por los mecanismos para el adelanto de la mujer del Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panamá y República Dominicana, les traslado un afectuoso saludo a la vez nuestro deseo de que se alcancen resoluciones que permitan potenciar el empoderamiento de las mujeres, reduciendo las brechas de desigualdad de género en todos los ámbitos y esferas de la vida pública y privada. Con una década de existencia como CONCA, hemos realizado esfuerzos en todos los ámbitos, dando seguimiento a la implementación de nuestros planes estratégicos y a nuestra política regional de igualdad y equidad de género del Sistema de la Integración Centroamericana, PRIEC-SICA, aprobado en cumbre presidencial del SICA en diciembre del 2013. El empoderamiento económico es un área de especial énfasis, por lo cual diseñamos y promovemos la implementación de un programa de autonomía económica que incluye, entre otras acciones, un producto financiero regional en clave de género, estudios regionales y otros esfuerzos intersectoriales, todos ellos en coordinación con la institucionalidad regional. Por otra parte, iniciamos acciones para construir un modelo regional de presupuestación con enfoque de género. Hemos incidido en materia de prevención y atención de la violencia contra las mujeres a través de la institucionalización de un diálogo de alto nivel con la Comisión de Seguridad Centroamericana, impulsando la implementación de un proyecto regional de prevención de violencia contra las mujeres y respaldando técnica y políticamente un proyecto de protocolo adicional al Tratado de Integración Social para posicionar la violencia contra las mujeres en el derecho comunitario, entre otras acciones. Todo este esfuerzo se acompaña de retos en los ámbitos nacionales, regionales, cooperantes, actores sociales, pero a pesar de la voluntad política como mecanismos nacionales y regionales, la desigualdad sigue siendo un factor condicionante de primer orden para limitar las oportunidades de desarrollo humano, social, económico y ambiental a nivel individual y global de las mujeres. Desde nuestra mirada, la Agenda 2030 nos da nuevas oportunidades y por esto es necesario transversalizar el enfoque de igualdad en los 16 ODS como estrategia complementaria en el ODS, en el ODS 5, alcanzar la igualdad entre los géneros y empoderar a todas las mujeres y niñas, pues no es posible lograr el desarrollo sostenible si no hay igualdad de género. La igualdad de género es un principio y un derecho que debe permear toda la Agenda de Desarrollo, todos sus objetivos, desde la concepción e implementación de medidas hasta su monitoreo y evaluación, sus procesos de negociación, planificación, programación y presupuestación. Por ello, debemos recuperar el sentido de la estrategia de transversalización de la Plataforma de Acción de Beijing y los tomadores de decisión deben estar anuentes a establecer alianzas de alto nivel entre ellos y quienes estamos al frente de los mecanismos de igualdad, de modo que la perspectiva de género y el enfoque de derechos humanos de las mujeres sean incorporados de una vez por todas en la corriente principal de quehacer de los estados, esto es, en la creación de normativas, en los procesos de formación de ley, en la planificación del desarrollo, en la presupuestación, en la gestión de la cooperación, es decir, en todo el ciclo de políticas públicas. En tanto, es responsabilidad estatal, la igualdad de género no es un asunto exclusivo de las políticas de igualdad y de los mecanismos de igualdad. Al ser un derecho, es un asunto que implica a todas las instituciones y a todos los actores. Los ODS son una oportunidad para replantear las políticas nacionales y para transversalizar efectivamente la igualdad. Esto representa un medio de esfuerzo para los mecanismos para el adelanto de la mujer, por lo cual deben ser fortalecidos y tomados en cuenta en la formulación de políticas y leyes en todos los ámbitos. Los mecanismos que integramos el CONCA nos congratulamos con la nueva Agenda del Desarrollo, con el objetivo relativo a la igualdad y el empoderamiento, pero queremos reiterar que el ODS 5 refiere a estrategias de amplio alcance, por lo que inexcusablemente debe cruzarse en todos los ODS, con toda la agenda sectorial y con la gestión pública que realizan todos los actores que intervienen en el desarrollo de nuestros pueblos para el logro definitivo de la igualdad real entre los géneros. Muchas gracias. Agradezco a la ministra del Instituto Nacional de la Mujer de Honduras por su intervención. 
And I next give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Anya Kopach Mrak, Minister of Labor, Family, Social Affairs, and Equal Opportunities of Slovenia, who will be speaking on behalf of the Human Security Network. Thank you for the floor, Mr. President. I have uh, the honor to speak on behalf of the members of the Human Security Network, a cross-regional network composed of Austria, Chile, Costa Rica, Greece, Ireland, Jordan, Mali, Norway, Panama, Switzerland, Thailand, South Africa, as an observer, and my own country, Slovenia. The Human Security Network is an informal group of states that advocates for the greater usage of human security approach in policies and programs at the international, regional, and national levels. As, a hum as human security, as a people-centered and comprehensive approach, we want to use the 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women to highlight the interlinkage between the empowerment of all women and girls, the implementation of the Agenda 2030, and the improvement of human security. Gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls are an integral part of the Agenda 2030, critical for achieving all its goals, as well as to strengthen the human security of women and girls. Similarly, we must recognize the importance of the effective implementation of the Belgian Declaration and Platform for Action adopted at the Fourth World Conference on Women, as well as the outcome of the 23rd Special Session uh, of the uh, UNGA of Women 2000, Gender Equality, Development and Peace for the 21st Century and the full compliance of member states with CEDA obligations. We also want to reaffirm the need to accelerate full implementation of program of action of the International Conference on Population and Development and of other conferences whose purpose is to guarantee human rights of women and girls as well as to enhance the support for international mechanisms for advancement of women. All those instruments touch upon the human security of women and girls and their full realization of human rights, which include their rights to enjoy a life free from fear, free from want, and their ability to live in dignity. However, we still need to effectively address endemic violence commit committed against women and girls around the world. Another major challenge highlighted by the 2030 Agenda is the question of health. A gender-responsive approach to health must include the universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights in accordance with the ACPD Program of Action and the Belgian Platform for Action in order to address the specific needs of women and girls. The human security approach focuses both on protection and empowerment and thus can be a valuable tool in addressing those issues. More generally, the effective implementation of the 2030 Agenda will also depend on stronger democratic institutions, more inclusive particip participatory governance and greater accountability to deliver sustainable changes for women and girls. Women and girls must have equal access to quality education, economic resources, political participation, empowerment opportunities, and leadership and participation in decision-making at all levels. This also includes gender-responsive budgeting and capacity building in all areas, especially in the field of conflict prevention and resolution, while supporting networking of women's groups and enhancing, enhancing their capacity to participate in all stages of the peace process will contribute effectively in promoting just, peaceful, and inclusive societies in support of lasting solutions to conflict and insecurity. Last but not least, we need to create a safe 
an enabling environment for gender advocate, advocates and other civil society organizations so that they can fully participate in the implementation, follow-up, and review of the 2030 Agenda at the local, regional, and global levels. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Minister of Labor, Family, Social Affairs, and Equal Opportunity of Slovenia for her statement. Y doy la palabra ahora a su excelencia, la señora Yanira Argueta, ministra para la situación de la mujer de El Salvador. Actually, I have a correction to make. Uh, another intervention will be heard before El Salvador. So I will be giving the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Shamane Scotti, Minister for Home Affairs, Education, and Land of Nauru, who will be speaking on behalf of the Pacific Small Island Developing States. I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the Pacific Small Island Developing States. Chair, at the outset, let me congratulate you on your election to chair the 60th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. This year's theme of women's empowerment and its link to a sustainable development is appropriate as we begin implementing the numerous historic agreements we reached over the past year. Indeed, in the outcome to the third international conference on SIDS, the Samoa Pathway, we recognize that gender equality and women's empowerment have a transformative and multiplier effect on sustainable development and is a driver of economic growth in small island developing states. We have just reaffirmed our commitment to the importance of women's empowerment to sustainable development through SDG 5 and the 2030 Agenda as a whole. We know that true empowerment of women and girls, including in rural communities, cannot be attained without meeting all of our sustainable development goals. Overcoming challenges across broad sectors, from health to education, including through sports, will exponentially benefit our most vulnerable populations with women and girls at the forefront. This intersection is one of the best illustrations of what we mean when we call the 2030 Agenda integrated or irreducible. Our silo approach does not work and does not make sense. Our commitments to gender equality and to, and to implement the 2030 Agenda must be matched by, an, by a United Nations system that is fit for purpose. These commitments must also be matched by requisite support. In this regard, the rapid implementation of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, including those provisions for targeted support towards empowerment of women, is critical. Finally, gender inequalities, especially when intersecting with other economic and political inequalities, can leave women and girls uniquely vulnerable, both to, sh to shocks and ongoing crises in, the crises. in the Pacific, these vulnerabilities are seen especially in the effects of climate change and lack of access to healthy, productive, and resilient oceans. As adverse effects are felt in sectors ranging from food security, biodiversity, water resources, and health, all too often it is women who bear the brunt of the impacts, including their negative security imp implications. Therefore, we echo our call for the appointment of a special representative on climate and security as a way of ensuring that we leave no one behind. I thank you.
I thank the Minister for Home Affairs, Education and Land of Nauru for her statement. And I give the floor now to His Excellency, Mr. Edwin Batsu, Minister of Labor and Home Affairs of Botswana, who will be speaking on behalf of the Southern African Development Community. Minister, I'm not, I'm sorry, Chairman, I'm not uh, ready yet. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not ready. If you could pass. <laughs> really sorry. Um, yes, well, in that case, we will pass on to the next speaker, Her Excellency Ms. Aya Izatu Njie Saidi, Vice President of the Republic and Minister of Women's Affairs of the Gambia. Mr. Chairperson, Excellencies, it is with utmost pleasure and delight that I deliver a statement on this 60th session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. First of all, I extend heartfelt felicitations and best wishes from our President, His Excellency, Sir Professor Al Haji Dr. Ajay Jame, Babili Mansa, the government, and most of all, the women and girls of the Gambia. I would like to thank the Bureau for, of course, the unwavering efforts in the conduct of this very important event. And also commend the Secretary General for his statement, the CSW representative, and of course, the UN Women. Chairperson, this year's session is particularly crucial and timely, as the forum will provide a platform for sure to all of us to deliberate extensively on the Sustainable Development Goals, which is 17 goals, of course, and 169 targets. And of course, it would help us also come up with agreed concrete resolutions that can guide the implementation of these very important commitments made on gender equality, equity, and the empowerment of women and girls. Of course, without women, none of these goals or targets can be achieved for sure. Mr. Chair, it is crucial also to step up our collective efforts, particularly in delivering women's rights at this very critical moment to ensure that women's contributions are not missed out and their potentials and of course related institutions as well are fully utilized and capacitized for the good of all humanity. Over the years, the government of the Gambia, on its part, through its various sectoral policies and programs, demonstrated its commitment to work towards the reduction of gender inequality and ensures the promotion of gender equality, of course, and women's empowerment in all areas of development. In addition to the 1995 Beijing Platform for Action, and of course, its 12 critical areas of concern as well, the Gambia government has ratified and adhered to a number of international agreements and gender-related regional conventions, charters, protocols, and declarations. All these instruments highlight gender equality as an important approach and catalyst towards sustainable development. Mr. Chair, the government under President Jame's leadership further demonstrated its commitment to women's rights by first and foremost ensuring that equality of persons and non-discrimination based on sex is enshrined in our Second Republic Constitution, that is the 1997 Constitution. This is clearly manifested in the political ladder as women serve in different portfolios, such as vice president, ministers, ambassadors, members of parliament. In my delegation is the deputy speaker of the National Assembly, for example, judges and lawyers, as well as in the public and private sectors. And again, in my delegation is the deputy secretary general of the government. And of course, chief executives and board members. In the civil service, senior female government officials, most of whom also are in my delegation, and their male peers continue to rise significantly in various portfolios. In the area of poverty alleviation, government recognizes the need to reduce women's poverty as a major pillar in all development priority programs, because government discovered that poverty indeed has a girl's face and a woman's face. To this end, projects under the Minister of Agriculture are geared towards reducing rural household poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition through increased food and nutritional security, among others. 
and household incomes, particularly for vulnerable households. As a former president, His Excellency the President again has his back to the land called policy and vision 2016 initiative to grow what you eat and eat what you grow, and has positively impacted as a result in improving rural women's productivity and food insecurity as well. And this has helped the Gambia reach MDG 1C target of reducing hunger and malnutrition from 13.3% to 6% in 2015, for which His Excellency the President and the entire nation was commended and received an FAO award and commendation indeed. Similarly, in education, gross enrollment for girls has improved considerably to 101.2% in 2015. At the lower basic level, a gross enrollment rate of 73.1% and a completion rate of 90.9% were achieved the same year. At the upper basic level, the completion rate was 66% for girls. Maternal mortality rates have dropped as well from 730 per 100,000 live births in 2001 to 433 per 100,000 live births in 2013. Infant mortality also declined from 75 per 1,000 live births in 2003 to 34 per 1,000 live births in 2013. The government of the Gambia has further taken concrete actions to ensure that women's rights are promoted as well as protected. In addition to Please request you to kindly conclude your statement. Mr. Chair, a lot has been achieved in the government in the area of women's empowerment. But in conclusion, we believe that women's empowerment is key to achieving our national visions that I've mentioned earlier on, including Vision 2020 and Vision 2016, and of course 2063 as well. And we'll continue to accord high priority to all of this as a government and continue to provide the resources that are needed as well. Mr. Chair, I want to associate myself with the various statements of G77 and China and the Africa Group, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I thank Her Excellency, the Vice President of the Republic and Minister of Women's Affairs of the Gambia, and I believe we can have two more speakers before we break for lunch. So. The next on my list is uh, His Excellency Mr. Chandra Prakash, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Women, Children, and Social Welfare of Nepal. All protocols observed. My delegation aligns itself with the statement delivered by the Honorable Minister of the Kingdom of Thailand on behalf of the Group of 77 and China. I thank the Secretary General for his comprehensive reports under the agenda item and other distinguished speakers for their respective presentations this morning. Nepal fully agrees with the Secretary General's statement that the international community should focus on the realization of gender equality and empowerment of women with a strong political will if we are to achieve the plan, planet 50-50 by 2030. Mr. Chair, Nepal promulgated an inclusive and democratic constitution last September. The constitution brought the country's decade-long conflict to a logical end and also laid a concrete foundation for the overall development of country and its people, ushering an era of hope and prosperity. The constitution embraces the principle of, of human rights, human dignity, inclusion, proportional representation, and gender mainstreaming in a comprehensive manner. The conclusion, the Constitution also seeks to ensure the uh, realization of this principle through positive discrimination by putting gender and social issues at the core, particularly the rights of women and marginalized peoples, among others. The Constitution makes it mandatory that president and vice president of the country must be from different sex or communities. Likewise, either speaker or deputy speaker of the House of Representatives and chair or vice chair of the National Assembly must be woman. The Constitution also guarantees that at least one third of the federal parliament and, a, and at least 40 percent of the elected representatives at the local level must be women. The Constitution ensures women's right to lineage and right against all forms of exploitation, equal rights in family matters and property. It also provides a separate constitutional constitution on women to protect rights and interests of women. Mr. Chair, the government is committed to building an egalitarian society 
and enhancing social justice for women, children, senior citizens, persons with disabilities, and marginalized communities. Nepal is a party to human rights instruments, including seven core ones and two major ILO conventions. Furthermore, Nepal has been implementing the UNSCRs 1325 and 1820 through a dedicated national action plan, uh, including at the local level. Our development plans, policies, and programs have been focused on uh, de addre to address poverty, unemployment, injustice, inequality, and discrimination through an inclusive and participatory approach to development. The government has been implementing different national action, action plans, including CEDA, CRC, CRPD, to realizing gender equality and women's empowerment. Mr. Chair, Nepal started implementing gender responsive responsive budgeting since 2007 and has now reached 22% of the national budget. Similarly, the government has established a male leader network linking, with the, linking it with the Secretary General's Unite campaign to influence mass support for gender equality and women's empowerment. Nepal strongly supports the initiatives of he, he for she campaign by UN, by UN women and the engagement of men and boys is critical for the empowerment of women. The government has been implementing a zero tolerance policy on violence against women and girls. The government is also effortful to enhance accountability and facilitate a coordinated response to address violence against women and girls. Nepal is fully committed to implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and has prepared a preliminary national report on sustainable development goals for 2016-2030 to integrate the agenda into the national context, including SDG number five. Mr. Chair, in spite of tremendous progress in gender equality and women's empowerment, the government realizes that the significant challenges still remain, particularly in the aftermath of uh, massive earthquakes of last year. The post-disaster need assessment was engendered with a, with, a dedication, uh, with a dedicated chapter on gender equality and social inclusion, ensuring both gender responsive sectoral and overarching uh, recovery strategies. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, Nepal reiterates its commitment for human rights, women empowerment, and gender equality despite being a least developed and landlocked country. Emerging from conflict and the most recent human humanitarian crisis as a result of earthquakes last April and May, and cross-border disturbances in trade after September last year, Nepal is committed to step up efforts to clear the... Please conclude your statement. For a revitalized partnership with all our development partners and stakeholders with predictable means of implementation to realize the ambitious 2030 agenda, leaving no one behind. Thank you. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Women, Children, and Social Welfare of Nepal for his statement. And I give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Gulshara Abdikalikova. Secretary of State of the Republic and Chair of the National Commission for Women, Family and Demographic Policy of Kazakhstan. You have the floor. Уважаемый господин председатель, дамы и господа, Казахстан активно выступал в интересах женщин и девочек, будучи в ходе разработки цели устойчивого развития. Президент Казахстана Нурсултан Назарбаев на 70-й сессии Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН выступил с инициативой о том, чтобы каждая страна, Член ООН ежегодно перечисляла 1% от своего оборонного бюджета в специальный фонд ООН по финансированию целей устойчивого развития. В этом году независимости нашей страны 25 лет. В нашей стране мире и согласии проживают более 100 этносов, 17 религиозных конфессий. Одним из ключевых направлений построения демократического общества явилось достижение гендерного баланса. 
Первая создана институциональная основа, принята стратегия гендерного равенства, гендерная политика ре, ре, реализуется двумя законами о государственных гарантиях равных прав и равных возможностей мужчин и женщин, о профилактике бытового насилия. Второе. Расширяются политические, экономические и социальные права и возможности женщин. В парламенте страны женщины составили 26%. В экономическом продвижении более 42% субъекта малого и среднего бизнеса возглавляют женщины. За последние пять лет нам удалось сократить почти два раза материнскую и младенческую смертность. Таким образом, принятые меры позволили нам занять 47 место в глобальном рейтинге гендерного равенства Всемирного экономического форума в 2015 году. Уважаемый председатель, дамы и господа, мы должны продолжить совместную работу по расширению прав и возможностей женщин. С нашей стороны, стороны предлагаю, первое, разработать международный проект по защите женщин от угрозы терроризма, так как женщин зачастую привлекают к распространению этого зла используя их правовую грамотность. Второе – разработать международную этику мигранта, так как из года в год увеличиваются миграционные потоки. Третье – в столице моей родины в 2017 году будет проведена специализированная выставка «Экспо». Тематика «Экспо. Энергия будущего» – это использование альтернативных источников энергии, и развития зеленой экономики. На площадке Экспо состоится международный форум «Женщины. Энергия будущего». Мы приглашаем всех принять активное участие в этом мероприятии. Оно позволит расширить сотрудничество между женскими организациями в распространении лучших практик по вопросам расширения прав и возможностей женщин в целях устойчивого развития. Дамы и господа, нынешняя 60-я сессия Комиссии ООН по положению женщин призвана придать дополнительный импульс по осуществлению повестки дня 2030. Наша страна стремится к региональному сотрудничеству в области достижения защиты прав и расширения возможностей женщин и девочек. Располагая у себя мультистрановой опыс, офис ООН «Женщины», Казахстан инициировал создание регионального хаба ООН в Алмате, одним из основных направлений которого должно стать достижение совместно с государственными, государственными партнерами высоких целей Пекинской декларации в регионе Центральной Азии и за ее пределами. Желаю всем нам эффективной работы, креативных и открытых дискуссий. Благодарю за внимание. Thank you very much. I thank the Secretary of State of the Republic and Chair of National Commission for Women, Family, and Demographic Policy of Kazakhstan, and I thank the interpreters for allowing us to hear one more speaker, who will be Her Excellency Ms. Ellen Trane Norby, Minister for Children, Education, and Gender Equality of Denmark. Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome this opportunity to address the Commission at its 60th session. Last September, the world community adapted the 2030 Agenda, a set of ambitious sustainable development goals. Now our prime obligation is to act and to immediately implement all measures needed to pave the way for fulfilling of the SDGs. Denmark is proud to be among the countries that fulfill the commitment of contributing 0.7% of our GNI, as clearly indicated in the SDGs. I strongly encourage other developed countries to do likewise. Gender equality is a key value in a democracy, and it is a prerequisite for creating sustainable and prosperous societies. In other words, it's the very basis for our economic growth. Violence against women, human trafficking, gender imbalance in decision-making, stereotypical choices and patterns in education and on the labor market are areas where disparities still remain. In Denmark, as well as around the world, women face sexist, sexist abuse on a daily basis, 
that might discourage them from participating in our democratic debate or keep them from moving around freely. Another severe present-day challenge is the vulnerable situation for female refugees. We must act to support these women and protect them from violence and discrimination. Religion or culture cannot be used as an excuse to undermine the human rights of women and girls. Women's rights are fundamental rights regardless of one's background. Male and female refugees need basic information about the fundamental rights in Europe and elsewhere, such as gender equality and the rights of women and children. Sexual and reproductive health and rights are central to increasing women's opportunities and economic empowerment. We know what stands in the way. Lack of access to basic health services, lack of comprehensive sexuality education, laws and practices which limit women's ability con to control their sexuality and reproductive lives. In that same way, we must work to eradicate poverty as well as harmful traditional practices such as early child and forced marriages and female genital mutilation on a global scale. I hope that the agreed conclusions of this session will contribute to the ongoing discussion on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. In May, Denmark will be proud to host the 2016 Women Deliver Conference in Copenhagen. I hope to see many of you there. For the remaining time allocated to Denmark, I have been allowed to pass on the floor to my colleague, Ms. Eigen Samuelsson, Minister for Social Affairs for the Faroe Islands, a self-governing community within the Kingdom of Denmark. Thank you. Uh, the link between gender equality and sustainable development is one of the most important issues for the future of the small island nation in the North Atlantic, the Faroe Islands, with a population of just under 50,000. Even if the Faroese are one of the most equal societies in the world when it comes to income, the Faroese are significantly different from the other Nordic countries and quite unequal when it comes to income disparities between men and women. Traditional gender roles prevail, and this is reflected in the degree of women working in part-time jobs, more than 50%, which again has an effect on the wage income. Women earn 40% of the wages, even though the participation of women in the workforce is the largest in the world. The real concern for the future sustainability of our nation is the striking level of outmigration of women. This has left our small population with a large deficit of younger women, women who can and should be contributing to economic growth in the Faroe Islands. This poses a great threat to the upholding of the welfare system as we know it, this is to the sustainability of the Faroes in the coming years. Without the meaningful contribution of women to the future development of the economy, the sustainability of the Faroese society is at risk. Thank you for listening. We have heard the last speaker for this morning. The general discussion will resume tomorrow, Tuesday, at 10 a.m. And the first three speakers will be Botswana on behalf of SADC, Papua New Guinea on behalf of the Pacific Island Forum, and Canada. We are also adding an additional meeting tomorrow from 6 to 9 p.m. The Secretariat will issue a revised list of speakers. Please adjust your schedules accordingly. This afternoon, the Commission will hold four parallel high-level roundtables in conference rooms one and four, and in room four. Roundtable A on enhancing national institutional arrangements for gender equality will be held from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. in conference room four, followed by roundtable B on strengthening normative, legal, and policy frameworks for gender equality and women's empowerment from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m. 
also in conference room four. Roundtable C on financing for gender equality and women's empowerment in the 2030 agenda will take place from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. in conference room one, followed by roundtable D on fostering gender responsive data design, collection and analysis, and building a knowledge base from 3.30 p.m. to 6 p.m., actually from 4.30 p.m. to 6 p.m., also in conference room one. Thank you for your attention. This meeting is adjourned.